Today is Friday, September 23rd, 2022. You're listening to the Ask a Christian podcast. I'm your host, Nate. So, oh, I forgot. I, I'm, um, what am I? Prophet, prophetess, lioness, apostle, just, just all of it. Th- those are all my theological pronouns. Um, just everything. Um, very important. Forgot to mention that. Remind me to get my cash app set up. I'm kidding. Um, so it's Friday fun day. I did not plan on being here today, but as things changed, um, either coincidence or divinely inspired, <laughs> based on the discussion, it's probably just coincidence. Uh, well, no, actually, take that back. There, there's actually a really, really awesome uh, segment in here about hermeneutics and exegesis of Luke 4 that goes to Isaiah and, and all, all over the place, but it's super, super um, involved and enlightening. So um, perhaps it is divinely inspired. Anyway, but um, let's see. Are you a prophetess? What are your theological pronouns? <laughs> this is a super joke. I don't want to get Christian, Christian hate mail. Uh, it's not a thing. It's, it's a joke based on um, someone else's room where it seemed like everyone was like all kinds of like prophetess, prophets, preachers, apostles, um, pastors or thing. None of the other stuff. Anyway, um, that's it. Yeah, so there, there's mostly a Christian audience Q&A today. So it's it's a lot of good um, theological and spiritual edification. So if you have questions about hermeneutics and exegesis, especially of Luke 4, uh, pay attention to this and um, enjoy the fun stuff around the periphery of it because <laughs> it is pretty darn entertaining. Find us more on askachristian.podbean.com and bitshoot.com slash askachristian Christian? Christian. rumble.com slash askachristian and have an awesome weekend. About time, man. I was thinking the rapture happened or something. Like, where are all the Christians at? I don't know. I'm just getting some breakfast. I just stuffed into a client and just had to laugh because, <laughs> like, you know, I've been doing IT for, what, almost 30 years. I know how long things take. Like, I don't, I'm not Scotty and I exaggerate by two days, right? You know, like, I, I'm going to tell you exactly how long it takes. And there's this low voltage job they got to do at this restaurant that's just covered in grease. And I'm like, oh, yeah, this is going to be easy. And the guys get there, and I'm dropping off their electronics for them. And I'm like, hey, here's your electronics, guys. And they're like, did they talk to you about this job? And I'm like, what about it? And they're like, there's no way we're going to get this done in three hours. And I'm like, I know. It's a 14-hour job. And he's like, yeah. So we'll come back next week. I'm like, no, no, no. They install on Sunday. And he's like, well, what now? <laughs> like, yeah, you, got, you guys are going to be here like tomorrow night or tonight like you're gonna have to come back here on a friday night at two in the morning and start to get done saturday and i was like yep sounds like it sounds like overtime i'm like sounds like mark's losing a lot of money he goes yep sounds like it (laughs) (laughs) because this uh, guy that does satellite tv decided to use an l and a voltage company but he has no idea how to bid it he has no idea how to price it and he has no idea how long it takes and I'm trying to help him out and tell him, like, dude, this is a 14-hour job. You can't do it in four hours, you three guys. And he's just like, no, you watch us. And I'm like, cool, man. Do you have the Flash working for you? Is this, like, a thing? Like, did the Flash get a job with you? Because that would be impressive. And it would even take the Flash four hours. Because it's just a lot of work. Wow. You know, I didn't plan on being here today. But I thought after that room we were in earlier... Um, Maybe there would be an interesting conversation about it. <laughs> I mean, you know, the Flash is interesting too. But, Chris, I know you have some issues with Catholicism. But, <laughs> gun to your head, metaphorically speaking, which is worse? Some Catholic stuff or whatever the crap was going on in that room? Oh, that stuff. I've never seen more prophetesses and priests and apostles, I think, in one place at one time. Man, imagine if a meteor hit a mall and be like the apocalypse, the apostle, apostle, yeah, I don't know, apostle clips, <laughs> right? That, that, we can coin that word. Let's coin that. <laughs> oh boy. So let's see.
Man, you just can't make people wake up, I guess. I should have taken a day off. I usually do on Fridays. So, Chris, uh, did you, by any chance, sow your seed for $18? It was confusing because one apostle woman, um, I, I, is there a, I guess there's not a, a, a what, a genderized apostle? It's just if you're calling yourself an apostle, it's gender neutral versus if you're a, a woman priestess or prophet, you're a prophetess. Except someone didn't get that memo because there was, a, there was some woman in there who was prophet so-and-so. Oh. So I, I don't know what, yeah, I didn't know why they didn't distinguish between, you know, prophet or prophetess. It always makes me think of like a lioness, like out like on the, on the jungle, like roaming the plains. Like that's <laughs> the only time you really hear like the, the S part. It, it's like, oh, I'm a lion. I'm a lioness. What are, I'm a prophetess. What are female wolves called? Are they a... <laughs> Wolf, wolfesses? I... <laughs> I don't know. Like an... <laughs> None is to be sought. Anyways, it was one of the, the uh, I think, prophetess was uh, wanting you to sow that seed for $18. And uh, it was one of the uh, prophets or apostles was saying, no, no, no. Ignore that one. We need $50. $50 is what we need to reach our goal. And I don't know what their goal was. I think, like, you know, God gives them jets or something if they reach their goal. But um, that was interesting. Interesting conversation. Oh, you know what? It's kind of apropos. You know what a female wolf is called? Oh, boy, what? What a female dog is called. <laughs> is it really? 100%. Probably should have thought of that, but it seemed a bit. I don't know. I don't. I don't know if you you would rightly. I mean, if someone should be expected to link those two together. I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't have gone there, but that that is interesting. Well, I mean, I mean, if you've got a lioness, like you would think they could. You know, we need to change that now. We need to give female wolves a more noble title or something, more noble name. Like lioness, uh, you know, I, I could just I get this picture of like you know they're uh, capturing gazelles and like you know sinking their teeth into it and like rending the flesh and have blood dripping out of their mouth. Not unlike a prophetess, um, but that's kind of the same visual I get. Ooh, the word for it is a fay, f a e. What is for a female wolf a fay or sh a fay? Yeah, f a e. That, make, that makes me think of like Lord of the Rings elves or something, like a fey creature. <laughs> yeah, I'm not but... Oh, I watched this YouTube this morning. It was the Semerillion is three minutes extended edition that was 17 minutes. It was hilarious. Oh, so it was meant to be a parody or was it just funny how they condensed it so quick? No, they just condensed it so fast that I was just completely lost by like minute one. I'm like, what is even happening right now? Who are all these people? Because there's Dude, share, share that link with me. Like I, I, I would like. I kept meaning to like get around to reading the books, but that I mean that's never going to happen. So a condensed version would be nice. We'll see if I can keep up. But I, I went the other way, and I, I said I wasn't going to watch the new Rings of Power, the Lord of the Rings spinoff, and I held out for about a month. And then I thought, you know, it's there. It's just going to be bugging me on how bad it is until I watch it. So I've now endeavored to force myself to watch it, and uh, man, it's tough. I made it about eh, 15 minutes before I, I had my first big problem. I, I just found it boring. Like, I was bored. Like I, I Oh, you, are, you watched it already? Yeah, yeah, I tried. I was just like, all right. I mean, like, I'm not going to criticize something until I actually read it or watch it, right? So it's like, hey, dark. Um, I mean, so it I is watched. very boring. Yeah, it's boring. It was just, I was bored. I was like, okay, but that was well, not I'm my. Just gonna pause this. Like... Uh, how, how, what? Uh, how far did you make it? Um, I made it through the third episode, but I was just like, I had to stop many times and do something else because I was like, far. I think I'm on episode two right now but oh it is it is i usually watch it while i'm doing like facebook or something or checking emails in the background well 
Hello, Funky. Good morning. Good day. How are you? Uh, worried, I guess you could say, because um, Hurricane Fiona is headed right towards um, my province in Atlantic Canada. So, yeah, it's going to be a rough weekend. How close is it? Um, well, it's supposed to start around afternoon today. So, and then I, I don't know if it's going to get worse tomorrow, but it might. But it is not going to be good. Like, um, I think it's supposed to be around 120 to 140 kilometer per hour winds, something like that, 100 millimeters of rain. So, pretty brutal. Well, anything else on your mind, or is that consuming all of your uh, thoughts and time? Um, well, it's not consuming all of my thoughts, but I would say that it's most what's on my mind at the moment, yeah. Well, hoping for the best of luck. So is that like a Category 3, then, or 2? Yeah, yeah, Category 3. three? Yeah. Um, I, live in I think Florida. it was a Category 4, but I think it got downgraded, I believe. By the time it hits Canada, it might be a category, but you're probably going to more. Yeah. Um, since it gets over that cold I think the coast is going to weaken it a little bit. Yeah. I mean, you're just going to get some rain. It's not going to be like a Florida situation like Hurricane Andrew. Yeah, maybe. Um, a lot of... Uh, I know that... Um, What's the name for it? The municipalities are uh, worried about it because, um, like, one part of the province is getting it really hard and the other part isn't. So, it's like the top half. I think Cape Breton is uh, going to be getting it the worst. Is this divine judgment for Justin Trudeau? Uh, I sure hope so. Are Canadians that, pretty 50-50 on him? Um, to be honest with you, I'm not exactly sure if they're 50-50 because I know a lot of people that don't like him, but that may be just because of the people that I hang around with and it's a bias. But like my girlfriend, she she doesn't like him, but she's not necessarily against him because all the opposition um, – like, basically, other people, they don't, like, because they, like, represent one thing, then immediately she just disregards them as a whole. Which is goofy, but, I mean, it's politics. You can't really change it, people's minds. Good morning, Angelina. Hi. How are you? Good, alhamdulillah. What's on your mind today? What? What's on your mind today? My mind? Uh, I have like three questions, if you can answer me. Sure, let's start with number one. Okay, so why you crucified Jesus? I personally uh, did not. I mean, in a spiritual sense, we all did, but uh, I was not there. I am not nearly that old. I'm almost mm -hmm. that old. And second question. What uh, Virgin Mary represents to you? What? Virgin Mary, what represents to you? What Virgin Mary represents to me? To the Christianity thing, yeah. She is the mother of Jesus. Pretty much. Almost nothing. Can you, can you shut your mouth? I'm not even talking to you. Well, that's, so that's not going to go well. Um, well, I guess she removed, I, I guess she removed herself. I guess. Wow. I was like, wow, you dropped her. That changed. So, okay, so I was, I, I was trying to parse my way through this. I had a feeling like her tag was, I am privileged to have been born Muslim. 
Which, by the way, Christians would say you're not born Christian. You may be born into a Christian household. So I was wanting to ask that question. Guess we'll never know. But it said I was I was privileged to be born Muslim, and she was kind of kind of a little like spitfire, right? So I, I wonder how that would go, Chris. Um, you know, being a humble Gentile Christian that you are, do you think that type of uh, speaking to a male would be permitted in her privileged religion that she was born into, or do you think that would be met with? Um, I don't know. Like, there's so many questions I wanted to ask her. I was trying to, like, figure out a way to, like, gently and respectfully ask these questions. Um, but I, it looks like I'm not going to get my chance because she, she ran away after she told you to shut your mouth. But I just have a feeling that the, how do those two mesh? Like, how can you be privileged to be born a Muslim and then also have this penchant for treating men like that, which is fine for, you know, most of the world. But I, I'm pretty sure in that religion, that would not work out so well. So do you think that she was just expressing her anger upon you because you're not a Muslim man and she can do that? She can get away with it. She wouldn't or have I got a severe misunderstanding of Islam? I mean, she wouldn't get face slapped going back to the original conversation. By, by you or? or by anybody. Like, you know, I think she would get face slapped if she talked like that in her regular culture. For those just joining us, Faye is um, one of the names for a female wolf. Because uh, <laughs> I thought you were saying face slapped. I'm like, is that no, a thing? No, I, Faye? Oh my yeah. god! Oh my, <laughs> oh my gosh, that was great. She changed so fast on a dime, like it was. That's a little bit scary. <laughs> Wow, I'm gonna man, I'm gonna remember that, Chris. Would you would you be offended if if you're like start going to what off? I'm like, Chris, shut your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that'd be great. I don't, I don't want to. Man, that was rough. Fay slap. By said Fay. How, how is that spelled? F A E. Huh. Just like an elf. <laughs> What's up, Lou? He walked on to an interesting conversation. Good morning, M, Matt, everyone else. I mean, I was I was curious what question number three was. Do you yeah, do too. you have any I like can you guess what her question number three would have been? I I mean, so like the evidence uh, the, or, or what we the data we would have together is question one was why did I, apparently myself, crucify Christ? And you know, other than spiritually, hell, we all did. Uh, but what she was asking, I'm like, well, I, I'm not 2,000 years old. I, I personally did not crucify Christ, except spiritually, we all did. So um, that was question one. Question two was, what does the Virgin Mary represent to us? And uh, it took her a couple times for us to understand that. But um, we're like, well, well, she's just the mother, mother of Jesus. And Chris said she, uh, you know, almost nothing, just another human, uh, to which she was told to shut his mouth. That is glorious. And um, yeah, so so that's the data. What could question three have been based on that? I may have to hire her just to follow me around there. That <laughs> might keep me out of trouble. You'll be like at McDonald's trying to order a menu item. They're like, oh, I'd like a number three. And they're like, sir, we're out of pickles. You're like, how are you out of here? Shut your mouth. Right? Yeah. It could be a good thing. Uh, anyway, Funky, back to you. Yeah, so um, do you have any questions about Christianity? <laughs> nah. <laughs> no, I'm a bit of a Christian myself, but I'm still learning the ropes, you could say. Do you have any questions about hurricanes? I've been to many. No, not really. Not at the current moment. Not really. Oh, or priestesses or prophetesses, because, uh, Chris, did you notice that they are having uh, an event? One of the uh, cash-up fundraisers they had was to raise, I think, for a convention um, in your very own city. So, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if you buy a ticket, I would almost buy a ticket to attend. I, I'm curious. Dude, we need to go. Let's do that. Uh, that is so tempting. I, I would, I think... What I would do is like make a t-shirt that would be like, I'm one of the fruits of the spirit or something. Just have it say around and see what we're like. I'll make a t-shirt that just says modern day apostle. 
I, I mean, can I, uh, I mean, if we're doing this, like, I don't want to catch a lot of flack, but I mean, can, uh, let's just, how many titles can we fit on a, on a tagline? Like, I want to be a prophetess. I, I want to be a prophet. I want to be an apostle, apostolus. Like, I mean, if they can do it, like, we can do it. Let's just be all of it. That'd be sweet. Ooh, you know what I could do is I could look up a bunch of YouTubes on how to do cold readings. <laughs> Would that be amazing, dude? <laughs> wow. I bet we could walk out of there with five hundred dollars cash. Where do you think God's sense of humor ends and like, you know, being stricken by lightning like could begin? Could be a thing. Oh, I'm pretty sure it would happen. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we'd walk in the parking lot. We need to stay at least 15 feet. <laughs> All right. Anyone else want to jump on stage? Oh, Jump could, on up, I guys. I always get Todd White confused with um Oh, is it is it James White or the Bethel guy that did like the went around trying to like raise dead people and stuff like that? Is that is it it's something white? Todd James, I don't know. James, Are you familiar with that? James White is the reformed apologist. So oh, okay, then not that one. Um, yeah. Is it Todd? Todd is it White. Todd White? I think so. Are you talking about Todd Ben? No, I'm I'm sure the name was White, um, and I think it was like affiliated with like the Bethel stuff or, or something like that. Do, do you do you know like the the was a Dead Razor or something like that movie like, um, where they went super like sign wandering and you know like they had this whole movie about you know how, uh, you know God can still raise the dead and stuff like that. Which by the way I happen to believe if God wants to do it God can do it. Um, who am I to judge? But specifically, these people, that was the whole point of this, like, docu-series they were making. And anyway, so um, the point is nothing happened. Surprise. Um, but I think it was James. Spo James White spoiler alert. <laughs> oh, well, it, it's like a white guy with dreadlocks. I, I don't know what else. I don't know how else to describe that it. That is Todd White. Okay, okay. And, and then I saw, like, the um, the guy from Corn um, was, like, part of his group. So I'm like, well... You know, if he found some sort of Jesus, I, I guess that's better than where he was, but, eh, you know. Perhaps not. What are your thoughts? I don't know. I mean, which one's better? It's kind of like, kind of like between Faye and She-Wolf, right? <laughs> I mean, I haven't seen him asking for cash up. Wait, Todd uh, can the, you or read? The, uh, Todd White. Oh. Mac has a question. He says, "Can you read Isaiah forty-three, eleven and twelve, and explain it the way it fits our current generation?" Do you happen to have that memorized, Chris? Not memorized, but I have my trusty app. 43 what? Uh, 43, 11, and 12. And how it, uh, explain it, how it fits our current generation. You've been in that restaurant a while. I was just reading the, was reading the class. So, so this is the passage that people like to pull out uh, for Unitarianism. They like to pull out for what? Unitarianism. Ah. Uh, can you can you share the passage with us? Sure. 
do the, the is it quiet enough for me to do that? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, no, when you talk, it's good. Okay. But when, it, when it's silence. I, even I, am Yahweh, and there is no Savior besides me. It is I who have declared and saved and caused it to be heard, and there is no strange God among you. So you are my witnesses, declares Yahweh, and I am God, even from eternity. I am He, and there is none who can deliver out of my hand. I act, and who can reverse it? Okay, so uh, I'm wondering how how it comes into play that you would explain this for this current generation, other than how it's just explained for every generation. But um, how would you do that, or would you do that? Yeah, I mean, it's just about how God saved us. <laughs> so, so Matt, can you be uh, can, can you elaborate maybe on how how you wanted it applied to this specific generation? Unless that cleared it up, how it's for every generation? And Lou, are you speaking, Lou? I have a question for you. Uh, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to hear me. Wow. Well, my ears heard heard that. Um, okay, so I, I guess I have a question for anyone. So I'm often familiar with, uh, you know, whenever you will say something like, pardon my Americanness. It's like, hum, da, Allah, something like that. And you say that means Jesus is Allah. But then the person uh, who was just here a little bit ago came in and they were very, very Muslim. So, so they would definitely not say Jesus is Allah, but it sounded like they said, hum, da, Allah, like the very same thing you say, uh, which you say Jesus is Allah. And it sounded to my American ear that she said the exact same thing, but clearly she didn't mean that. Uh, the one who told Chris to shut his mouth. Um, so can you can you explain like, am I saying it wrong or am I hearing it wrong? You know. <laughs> yeah, neither do I. Oh, so you say the same things, but when you say it, you mean something different than when they say it. Is that correct? I'm going to take that as a yes. Yeah. Oh, read the chat. Re read the what? So the chat. Oh, so read the Mac chat. Is, Mac is late. Oh. Uh, no savior besides me. So Jesus says there no, there's no savior besides me, and that's what Mac says. So um, you're saying what Jesus says. Yeah, so Yahweh is a reference to the true and living God who is three persons and one persons, i.e. the triune God. Yeah, uh, how to the lie, praise be to God. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Jazz. What's up? What's good? How'd your gig go? Went pretty well. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, your gig was good? Yeah, everything um, went pretty well. We had a nice amount of people there. And uh, we got people that sent... I guess, uh, text messages to the group's Instagram account to see if we could play other places too. Bro, that's great. You guys have room for an Alto Sax? Want a 12 year old to come join you? Yeah, <laughs> uh, if he wants to start sh shedding John Coltrane and Charlie Parker jazz lines. And he can get those down at like 200 beats a minute on double time swing. Let him uh, go for it. And I'll, I'll hear him. He can come in. 
<laughs> I'll get him on it. I mean, he's supposed to join that jazz band next year. Yeah, so, so if he, if I think he, he finally has the lung capacity. Yeah, if he wants to, I guess, join into the group, uh, he would have to really kick up improvisation because the entire group, whenever we go gigging, a lot of what we do is based off improv. So not only would it have to be like knowing the general like jazz standards uh, that most jazz musicians know whenever you go out somewhere, like we all should know like a certain standard list of songs, which is what we have jazz standards. It's all in the real book of things that we should know if we go anywhere with musicians. So like, let's say I go to like this jazz bar that has like an open musician join in for the day. Right. And I go in there and let's say one of the other musicians calls out Stella by Starlight. Right. I'm just like, Oh, okay, cool. Got it. Or if somebody calls out, Oh, Autumn Leaves is up. I'm like, okay, got it. Like you're all supposed to have it known by memory. And then after that, you're going to have to know how to solo over the chord changes too. So if anything, if he wants to get into it, just tell him to start studying some music theory and start getting into some, uh, improvisation with his sax teacher if he has one. Chris could have been a singer, but he was commanded earlier to shut his mouth. Yeah. Pretty sweet. He could have been a, a <laughs> singer in a different dispensation. <laughs> now, our friend uh, Nate Bart Ehrman is back. Who's I, I? Who's that? I, I mean, not the real Bart Ehrman, but this Bart Ehrman. I don't think I've talked to him. You always talk to these people that I oh, never know, and you're like, you're like, we talk to these people for five hours. I'm like, bro, I've never met them. <laughs> no, he's he's just a Muslim. Uh, Mac, I saw your hand. I did invite you up, so if it's not working, um, try leaving and coming back, or accept it as uh, God's divine will. Oh, I kicked you out. Oh, I guess I have met him. Inshallah. Deal with your Bible, disapproving another religion doesn't prove yours, uh, disproving. Uh, yeah, I don't really care about disproving another religion. So, I mean, I, I guess that wasn't directed at yeah, me. Yeah, it was directed at Zag. That's, oh, okay, because that's, that's not really my thing. So, uh, anything else going on? Uh, dispensationalism is false. Oh, Jag and Chat. Uh, Me and Devin had a good discussion about the covenant. Really? Yeah. How long ago was it? It's like 9 o'clock last night. Oh, shit. That's cool. That kid yeah. is very sharp, bro. I'm really telling you, bro, our friend group, bro, little young, the young Presby's, bro, our friend group, it's it's over, bro, it's over, it's over. Put us against the papists already. Like I really, I really want you to come in, Chris, into a room where Alvin, me, and Tyler are all together talking to papists because it always gets really fun when all three of us team up against them. <laughs> Let's just say papal infallibility. And the bodily assumption of Mary are our two favorite talking points. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a good one. That only came out in, what, the 1850s or something? No, it came out in 1950. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. That's that one. Yeah, what was so the one that came I out in the eighteen fifties was that that it was a different Mary Jane, right? Yeah, that was a that was a different dogma. But what I but my favorite joke to make is always, uh, my grandmother was born before Mary was bodily assumed. Michael, welcome. Save us. We're, we're telling intellectual church jokes. <laughs> yeah, I could be a real jerk. Is there such a thing? Um. <laughs> uh, or, well, I guess not like actual jokes, but like... Uh, I said um, that to <laughs> Michael, you know what? I, I've been thinking about this. Have you ever been to Orlando? Have or I ever USA? Oh, I've been to Orlando. Sorry, you broke up with me. I said no, I've never been. We're going to be all going to Ligonier. You should come down to Ligonier. Uh, I think it would be very interesting. Oh, yeah, for Wouldn't sure. It? Yeah, for so sure. You cut out there a little bit, Chris. I'm not sure if it was your side or my side. 
that it was going to be that going to Ligonier would be interesting. He said for you. And I said, th- I said for sure. Cause I went last conference and it was definitely really a lot of fun. When is this, when is said conference? Didn't you say it was sometime in March, Chris? Yeah. The end of March, the last week. Yeah. Well, if I can, uh, so my wife, baseball fanatic. So if I could tie baseball into that trip somehow, I could probably talk her into it. Oh, we have spring training teams down here. So, yep. Yeah. And we have a t- and we have a ton of what's it called, uh, high school and college athlete uh, showcase events down here too. So she does enjoy the she does enjoy the spring. Regularly. So Michael, I have a question for you. Fire away. Okay. Are you born again? Uh, no, I'm an atheist. <laughs> Do you want to be born again? <laughs> well, I, well, not right now, because I, I don't... I, whoa, 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 whoa. No, 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 not, not right now. It's a, it's a yes or a no. I want you to plant your flag, please. Oh, my oh. gosh. What has happened? I, I should have just not been here today. <laughs> you should have not gotten out of... It all started with the prophet S's and the apostles and cash apps. That, that's why I'm here today. <laughs> oh, okay. Do I want to be? Well, yeah. I, if uh, it's so, I guess if you're if you're channeling Roy, I, I would say just message him because he's pretty sure where I plant my flag. <laughs> okay. All right, people listening, this is what you get for not giving us something better, and you know whatever's going on in chat. Oh no. Uh, looks like there's a holy word going on. Oh yeah, yeah, oh, just... yeah. The Muslims are in this chat. I don't know. <laughs> well, it's like a Muslim versus a Unitarian. Is that is that right? Wait, is it? I I think he said Mac was. Is that who's sweet. arguing in chat? Well, Mac may be a martyr. Not a... Wait, I have no clue what's going on here. Wait, wait. I'm going back to bed, guys. You do? Like we have no idea. No Muslim. No, 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 no. Mac Jan looks like a Muslim. He's like, no, he's not. He's not one of us. He's a Muslim. Oh, I thought you said it was a Unitarian, Chris. Wait, so, oh, wait, it's two Muslims. It, well, it can't be two Muslims fighting unless they're the wrong kind of Muslim. No, they're responding to one Christian. <laughs> oh. Wait, that's actually an interesting... Wait, wait, I, I, want, I want to read that. Hold up. Can somebody pull up Matthew 19, 29? Because according to Bart Ehrman, 100 wives for Christians in heaven. So, so our Bible, Matthew nineteen, yeah. says we all get a hundred wives. Uh, we all get a hundred wives in heaven, apparently. Matthew nineteen twenty nine. Oh, sweet! Here, I'll read it. I can barely. And, who, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children for my name's sake will receive one hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. Wow! So we get a hundred sisters too. <laughs> I mean, just for kicks, just the next verse, just like read it out of like the Jehovah's Witness version of the Bible, just for fun. <laughs> Hold up, let me... Well, no, if you if you really want to have fun, get her you know, out of the Book of Mormon. Come on, let's 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 yeah, up our game. Come on, Michael. Um, for April Fool's Day, we're gonna do a great reversal. So, oh, you... actually, it wouldn't even it wouldn't even be a hundred. I'm sorry, it wouldn't even be a hundred. It'd only be seven times as much. We'd only get seven because. Uh, the Greek word uh, "polaplacion," uh, when you have it there, it only it's in the genitive, which it's in. It's only uh, sevenfold, or ma- or in this case, it could be many times more. Or sevenfold would be like the max. So I would get seven sisters. Yep. And then Bubby would date all my sisters. That's right. This is getting weird, guys. <laughs> Nate, you keep saying it's weird. I'll date your sisters too. <laughs> getting sisters, apparently. Wait, brothers too, right? <laughs> or does it not does it not say does it not say brothers? Leviticus eighteen twenty two. By the way, you get <laughs> mothers and fathers too. I don't know how that works. That'd be good times. Listen, as somebody grew up who grew up with four sisters, that's enough. Bro, you're gonna have seven moms. Um uh, okay. Oh wow. So now I know why you're atheist. <laughs> you grew up with four sisters. That's, that's it. You can, <laughs> that that was the linchpin. That's, the <laughs> that's pretty good. Um, tear so that yeah, tear Michael, that away, me, and I'm um, born again. Let me see if I can let me see if I can find out some spring training information for you. 
Um, but I think it'd be I think it'd be really interesting to have you come to Living Here. I'll even buy your ticket. Michael and Bubby <laughs> live debate. No, I've asked uh, I, my I don't do, de- I don't do uh, debates. <laughs> I, I do. I have. I, I have do conversations street epistemology. <laughs> no, I, I have well, conversations with people. Okay, that's fair. Well, I mean, you should also see if that uh, coincides with the um, the cult. I mean, the um, thing from the the prophetesses that they were wanting cash apps for, because that is also in our that is also in Orlando. Oh, Bubby, right, you weren't here for that. So uh, w- the whole reason I'm here is because I woke up and for some reason thought it would be a good idea to click on a room. It, it was the highest room I ever saw. It was like a, over a thousand people in it, oh, no. and there were more quote prophet prophets prophetesses apostles, apostles. and like. Maybe like apostles is like like every, everything you could not want in a Christian room was there every yeah. title and um, anyway so I, I thought it wise somehow to click on it so I listened to it first thing in the morning and um, I, I had to ping Chris because it was so good I was like grabbing screenshots just for you know I guess my messed up amusement but it's it's like you know the people are asking for cash apps and they're arguing about the, the amount someone's like I need eighteen dollars so a seed of just eighteen dollars yep, and then yep. someone corrected them and they're like no no it's fifty we need fifty dollars so that seed to meet to meet our deadline and um apparently it's for a big conference in Orlando so Bubby maybe you can get a jazz gig there um <laughs> but uh, uh yeah so you, you know you know you know what I'm gonna do I'm gonna get a jazz gig there tell all my music all, a lot of my musician friends are Christian too so I'll have them in on it too but basically I'll get all those kids up with me. We're all going to go there. We'll play for free to ourselves, but we're going to charge I... them to play, right? And all that money that we get from them, we hand right back to the members of their church because that's the money they got stolen from them. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's interesting, the first thing I think about when I think about all the prophetesses is, is I wonder if Kat Kerr was there. Um, and then the uh, second thing that I... That's speaking um, to my heart, Michael. That's speaking oh, to my she heart. Is, she is hysterical. Um, she's and, seriously and then the my second... favorite, though. She is my favorite. Oh, no, she, 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 she's amazing. We should get she's together and have a... Is she Canadian? Watch party. No, she's not. No, she's oh. not Canadian. Sadly, no, we won't, we won't lay claim to her. Chosen. Is she American, or, or did we dodge that bullet, too? Is she something else? Oh, no, she's American. No, no, she, Let's she's go. American. Ah. But, but the other thing that I'd wonder is all these, all these uh, prophets and prophetesses and stuff like that that are asking for all this money— I mean, the, the, the Bible says in a couple of, of places, you know, that, you know, wherever two or more of you are gathered, I'm there. And, you know, anything you ask for in prayer, if you believe it, it'll be yours. It'll it'll be granted to you. So, I mean, they unfortunately, in, in this instance, the Bible actually provides a methodology for the testing of this stuff. So they, they, they could just, you know, they could just hold their hands out and pray together and it, stuff should just happen for them, right? No, I mean, it, that, yeah. that kind of that yeah. makes sense from that position. Yeah. So like. Uh, and it's really ironic because a lot of them teach this message of like just speak it into existence. So speak your donations into existence, dog. Don't ask me for them. There's a there's a great sound clip of Joyce Meyer talking back to her wallet. She's like she pulls her wallet out on screen. And she's like, talk to your wallet. It's a big fat full. Oh hey, let's. Anything you want to comment on, uh, on, on chat? Let's see. I'm just reading the last comment. I don't know about the other hundred. Uh, it's I thought in Christianity, it. women don't have basic right. Um, and let's see. That was countered by I thought only women are half brain, according to Allah. Um, so they're still going, wow, okay. fighting the good fight. Okay. okay. How long? How long? How long ago did women get the right to drive in your Muslim countries? Oh, forgot. My bad. Well, it would depend was, on the uh, country, I guess. I think that was last year. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. There's been a lot of uh, terrible stuff. I'm sure you guys are familiar with all the atrocities right now going on in Iran. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Because yeah. people, because some weir- weirdos that get turned on by hair all of a sudden can't stop beating women for being women. <laughs> well, it's not even just beating them. I mean, like there, there have been several people that have been killed yeah, by the you, yeah, yeah. I've, I've seen a ton of them too. Yeah, the, yeah. Have you seen any of like the live leak videos that have come out of there? It's crazy. No, I know. It's it's traumatic. No, no, I can't watch it. You can't unsee yeah. things. Like there's just all those that videos like... that come out of Muslim countries. I just can't watch them. I got desensitized to it because in like seventh grade, all of us went on like live leak and saw like ISIS beheading videos for the first time, and we're just like, "Oh wow, that's uh, a that's, that's, that's what my son is doing in seventh grade right now. Yep, like that's what he's actually doing right. Now. Yeah. <laughs> what? 
But, uh, okay, so like sixth through eighth grade, there's like a giant, uh, at least like now, there's like a giant phase of like, you will have to end up watching some sort of like really gross thing or some really terrifying thing or some really glory thing at one point. Like sixth grade was the whole two girls, one cup thing. Uh, what? Was the whole thing. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's basically a video. Of, you like, godless Orlando people? <laughs> yeah, so it's like <laughs> pretty a, much. It's a video of like two girls pooping into a cup or something. Then I, I know what it is. Like, yeah, <laughs> and then the and then seventh grade Michael was ISIS beheading videos. That. Yeah, seventh grade was ISIS beheading videos, I, and then eighth grade was um what, what's it Kumbaya, called? Kumbaya, my word. Kumbaya. <laughs> And eighth grade was a ton of like really bad street fight videos that ended badly, like curb stomping people and stuff. That was eighth grade year. And then ninth grade, we got normal again, and then just started talking to each other like human beings. I I I don't even. I, oh. Everybody, pause for eight is close. I don't know where to go. <laughs> oh, Someone all, give me an off ramp. It's all going straight to hell. <laughs> yeah. just, just look at Chris's picture. You'll get you'll get an idea. Hundred percent. I graduated the dumpster fire. Okay. Oh, you know what? Um, okay, so so what is that? I can't really see it. Is it like some parliamentary building or what? What is that? It's just a big house. It's on fire. It says yeah, okay. The, house, the, so. the next thing. So you need to have stages. You have the little dumpster fire for normal stuff. You have this one for elevated stuff. The next thing you need is like. Um, what's it called? Where like the the uh, abode of Zeus, where he like hangs out and lords over all the other uh, other gods. Oh, I okay, yeah, yeah. To, well, <laughs> I was gonna. Well, poke well, yeah, but I call it the the January sixth insurrection. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> but um, um, but yeah, I, was, I mean, I guess technically Mount Olympus, but I was thinking like some like heavenly, you know, like maybe like a, a area carved out of Mount Olympus where he's hanging out with the other gods, like, you know, in this very, like, elegant-looking oh, thing James, and having that, James like, a dumpster fire. That's a good suggestion. He said Notre Dame. Notre Dame would be a really good one for the next thing. <laughs> oh, burning Notre Dame. Yeah, that's good. Or a, a At some point, fire. you've got to get... What about a fire tornado? Those are sweet. A fire NATO? At some fire point, you've got to get they the Pantheon in, in there burning. They have everything I saw, awesome I've seen those. in Australia. Like, they have yeah, everything the awesome that, that wants can... to kill you. I know. Like, Australia is, like, the most lethal continent. It's kind of awesome. Bro, Im imagine getting a spawn point in Australia, bro. Could never be. <laughs> It'd be brutal. So, apparently, there's some sci-fi movie that I haven't seen yet, and somebody was talking about it, and essentially, like, some aliens, like, land in the middle of the outback of Australia, and they're trying to understand what's going on, and essentially, like, everything is killing all of them. Like, yep, dead immediately. Like, yeah, they're just like they're just like, what is this planet? Because they were like talking about like invading or invading the Earth or whatever, and they got one load of Australia and they buggered off. Uh, welcome, Stephen. I am inviting you. So if you're not able to get in, maybe leave and come back. But I I am inviting you. Hey, yeah, did you guys? What do you guys think about that red heifer thing? Like the five red heifers? Like, what what do you guys think about that news? Or have, has your think, time been consumed with like you know beheading videos? I think uh, I think I'd rather watch a beheading video, but. Um, Oh, has that has that perfect heifer been uh, been been uh, born? Apparently, five apparently of them have been like genetically five engineered or something. Red heifers have been delivered to Israel for unknown purposes. <laughs> well, no, the whole thing is uh, I, there's a there's some kind of uh, prophecy there's related to this, right? Like there's supposed to be some perfect uh, some perfect heifer that's going to be sacrificed by some virgin like that's been living in a bubble tent or some some, some like like well, that. And so uh, and he he, he slits the throat of the heifer and then you know and then the second coming. So where this comes from is that the in, in Leviticus this is the first sacrifice to restart temple sacrifice. So it has to be you have to anoint things with the ashes of the red heifer to be sacrificed. Um, and then there's the piss off and all this other stuff. So it's all based on Levitical law, and that would be the reestablishment of the sacrificial system. The main thing that they would have to do, though, is they would have to level the dome of the rock and rebuild the temple. So, I mean, good luck with that. So, what? Um, so, so, like, does this actually mean anything, or is this just like, uh, or hang on, not like, does it actually? But like, could could it? Uh, okay, so hang on. There, there's a specific way I want to go. Not does it mean anything for like eschatology or something, but like, what what are the actual real life ramifications? So now they have five heifers. 
Uh, congratulations. So um, the next step, if anything was actually going to happen, they would say, okay, now we need to anoint these things, um, which still doesn't mean anything until we level the Dome of the Rock, right? That would be the next step. That would be the so next like, step. Okay, so like if there was like political calls and stuff like that, and people showed up with like pickaxes and backhoes, then there would probably be some stuff on the news about that, right? I mean, I would think because the Dome of the Rock is enormous, like they would have to bomb it. Like well, you know what I mean. JDAM. But right, so just the fact that there's some cows running around, so the fact that there's some cows running around doesn't inherently mean anything. Um, it's really the next step that would have ramifications. I'm fairly certain that secular Israelis are not going to let some crazed uh, ultra-Orthodox blow up the Dome of the Rock to bring on Messiah. Like, I don't think that's Right, right. But I mean, that would be the next, right? So like if people would start like calling for it, right? Like writing articles or getting on news conferences, be like, yes, we need to take back this place and blah, 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 blah. They could have other people be like, no, 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 it will never happen over our dead bodies. And they're like, ah, funny you say that, for example. Right. We're not saying that prophecy is not true. We're saying that people interpret prophecies wrong. Uh, Jamesy, no, that is not what I'm saying. Uh, Stephen, what's up, Stephen? Oh, I, 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 I'm just going to feel guilty about changing the tone. Are you going to be okay if, I, if th this may change the tone a little bit? But um, are you going to call for was, the destruction of the Dome of the Rock? Uh, no, no. Just, just, so, checking, just making sure. So, so we are having a discussion about um, uh, Philippians four four and who are the best Christians at living out four four. You know when it says rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Um, like when you think of that, who are the people that do you think? Who are the like Christian men that you? Because I think I, I think of more women that, that that can live out this rejoice in the Lord always. Um, when you think of men that do the rejoice in the Lord always, Nate, like who do you think of? Or do I, I see somebody leaves as soon as I as soon as we don't we stop about talking about behaviors. He, thinks, he, he don't obviously talk. thinks of me. Uh, besides, besides, besides Chris, I think of uh, you know. David. Uh, yeah, because it, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's interesting. We were, we were doing a study. Have you done a lot of word studies, Nate? Because, you know, when I first did some things and I was wondering which. OK, here's here's another question I was going to ask. What word studies have been the most impactful for you? I don't know if you're a word study person, but when I first came to know the Lord, I looked up the word strength and I looked up all the strong verses because I didn't want to be a weak, a weak in this. And that. And I looked up all the word, all the verses with the word strong in it, like be strong in the Lord, um, beat your plowshares and the swords and your pretty hooks and the spears. Let the weak say I'm strong and go the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man. You know, I consider now for the Lord has chosen you to build the house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. I mean, have you done word studies that have really impacted your faith? And what would you suggest if I'm mentoring a, a, a person? You know, which which ver, which which word study make, impacted you? And I'll be... Um, not not in super detail. Uh, when something comes up, like when I need to know a word, I look at it, but I don't specifically uh, don't recall going on deep dives and full biblical word studies. And the, other, the other thing that I was going to ask is, how do, when, when, when you go in the verses and they say in Christ, in Christ, and then like the, the Christ, I don't know if that's like, does that mean when they say in Christ in, in, in the Bible, is it the same thing as, you know, when, when Paul is saying, you know, um, it's no longer I, but Christ who lives in me. So anytime it says in Christ, does that mean the person that's reading it? It's like the Christ in you, it's having a communion with that? Or what's in Christ mean? Like the simplest term is saved. You're born again. You have eternal life. So uh, a lot of times people like, act like this stuff is like super spooky and like weird, and like very ethereal and hard to understand. I'm like, uh, almost like any time someone would think that, be like, no, no, just it means saved. It means good with God. That's what that's what that means. Christ living in you. It's I who die, yet not I who live, but Christ lives in me. You're saved. You're born again. That's what that means. And I, I do want to th thank you for which what, what you're doing because I had a couple. I had a couple people that popped in that uh, that know me, and um, I think some of the thing that you're doing really really well. I just wanted to highlight this is when you keep the main thing the main thing because sometimes um, you know when you when you circle it back to 
Um, what does this have to do with you believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus? And it was like, oh, okay, good. <laughs> because sometimes it is the weirdest thing when I'm in a debate room and I'm listening and uh, Jesus doesn't really come up much, but it's probably like 92% philosophical terms. And um, Jesus is the name of Jesus is lucky if it gets mentioned all oh, maybe once every two and a half hours or something. And that's what you're supposed to be arguing for. And it, it's a weird thing, but I don't, I don't, that, that your, your experience is very different. I want to thank you for doing that. I'm done. Well, sure. Thanks. I mean, we talk about the importance of hermeneutics. You know, no, 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 and no. expositing scriptures. Are there, now, now, when you do ex expository, what do you think of anagogical revelation in terms of uh, of, ex of, of hermeneutics? Like when I studied anagogical revelation, do, do, do you think that's an, that's one proper way to interpret scripture is how heaven sees the scripture? No. I mean, did you want me to elaborate? Oh, on yeah, that yeah. Go, go, go for it. Keep elaborating. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, the correct way to interpret scripture is the way that the apostles and prophets interpreted scripture, and that is through the historical, grammatical, literal lens. And so when we try to take any other meaning from the scripture outside of historical, grammatical, literal, that will always, without fail, lead to error. So do you think Jesus so, do you think Jesus did it the, interpreted scripture the wrong way? Jesus interpreted scripture the literal, historical, grammatical. You can prove it from scripture. Hmm, I'm not sure about that. I could prove it to you. There's a really good book you should pick up. It's called The Hermeneutics of the Biblical Writers by Abner Chow. So, so, so like like when like when let's do a simple one simple one just break sure. show, show it to me in a simple one luke, luke 4 18 where jesus quotes isaiah 60 how did how did jesus interpret that one luke 4 18 and and uh and isaiah 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 61 rather isaiah 61 where, where jesus is going in in the, in the bible itself okay, give me the breakdown of how that looks your hermeneutic using luke 4 18 through 20 and uh Say Isaiah 61, 1 through, one right. through 4. Again, How does that so, look? Right. So again, through, through, the, the, through the lens of historical, grammatical, literal, the New Testament writers would sometimes um, quote things not in terms of the original interpretation as the author meant in the Old Testament verse, but they would quote it for emphasis or for, for lack of a better word, oomph. And so when we talk about how verses are used, like Hosea 111. Um, can we start with, you know, with, can we start with that one, though, to just, just that specific one so I can understand, like, hey, look, sure. I was talking to Chris, and I talked to him specific. He asked for a specific example. I said when Jesus pulls out the Bible and he, and he, and he goes out of order, and because uh, I even think Jesus went out of order, because I think that what I, well, t tell me how, how you look uh, at that Out of order verse. in what sense? I uh, 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 what you, 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 you can, you, uh, okay. So, so, well, just Jesus quotes his mission statement, right? And he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he's quoting Isaiah. I just think it's important because I think Jesus it's his mission statement. I, well, give, give me the breakdown of how you see. I, 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 give, give me specifically, don't jump to Hosea or something. Sticking right with Luke 4, 18 through 20. Yeah, explain I'm, I'm Luke 4, 18 through 20. What I'm trying to do is explain to you the difference between emphasis and meaning. Okay. And so when, when I say, I released a new app for the iPhone that will be one giant step for mankind. What do I mean by that? Well, but do, do, do you know, I don't know what you mean. Because, like, here's, here's what I want to be clear. Don't. Do you start with who wrote it, when was it written? I mean, do you have a, a hermeneutic that way, or do you just jump all yeah. over the map? No, just give me a breakdown literal, of that, that specific. That is the literal, historical, grammatical method. Okay. I'll... So we start with who is the author, who is their intended audience, how was he writing? What language was he writing in? What culture was he in? You know, et cetera. So let's start with Luke 418, as you asked. Um, but let's start a little bit further back. So 17, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the scroll and found the place where it was written, 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor and has sent me to proclaim release to the captive and recovery of sight to the blind and to set free those who are oppressed to proclaim the favor of the year of the Lord. And he closed the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all were speaking well of him and marveling at the gracious words which were coming forth from his lips. And they were saying, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, No doubt you will quote this proverb to me. Sorry, there's a glare on my computer here. Um, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard took place at Capernaum, do also here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly, I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. But I say to you, in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, and when a great famine came over all the land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zephyrah, the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel at the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with, they heard these things, drove him out of the city and led him to the edge of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down off the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went on his way. So that's a that's a fairly long pericope of scripture. And what why you're did asking you, why did you do, why did you stop there and not keep going? Uh, because there's there's a. Uh, yeah, how, how, how do you how do you how do you decide? Luke four thirty one. How do you decide? How do you decide specifically? How do you, how do you decide where you start to get context and where you end to get context? Let's just use this as an example. You should go to this. this great. Pardon? Yeah, okay. So so. We do that by using the grammatical, historical, literal method. So when I went to 417, we got context as to what was going on before he used the verses. And so he was in the synagogue. It sets the stage. Why didn't you, use 16? Heard... Why didn't you, why didn't you use 16? Because then he said, so he came to Nazareth. Why did you leave 16 out? Because it wasn't pertinent to the discussion at the time, but we could go all the way back. I could read the entire book of Luke to you for context. No, but, but I'm just trying um, to I'm just trying to get like, why would you start with 17 rather than 16 if we're getting context? Just in this specific one. In this specific one, I started at 17 for brevity because it was a long pericope. And so, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. So like, we know that he's in the synagogue. I mean, we could have started at 16. 16 would have been the beginning of the pericope. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and it was his custom. And he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. Did you need any of that context to understand what was happening? No, no, no. I just wondered why, why you, when, you, when you, you, you kept yeah. going longer. What, what, what verse right. did you stop at? Which I verse did you stop at, at? I stopped at 30. Okay. So, so, because it so, tells uh, the entire story of what happened instead of taking the verse 18 out of context. Okay. And, and then so, 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 so when you're breaking down something like this, what, 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 mm-hmm. what do you look at it as then? Like, how, how do you what? break down this one? So, so we know, we, so, so okay. give me a breakdown of, th- of this one through, through the way you interpret scripture. It's not the way I interpret scripture. It is the correct way to interpret scripture. Let's just establish that right now. Okay. If you do not interpret literal, grammatical, historical method, you have failed in understanding scripture. Okay. Because what the intent of this is, is to find out what the author's meaning of what he is writing is. And so when we're talking about Luke 4, for instance, the story in there is not to emphasize the verses that he read out of Isaiah, because everybody was fine when he did that. And then he literally said, and by the way, here's going to be your response, because he was calling out their unbelief. And that's when they were enraged and wanted to kill him. So, 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 right? so, so help me understand this historical part. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. the, the, in, 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 when you go into Judah, okay, so, and he was handed the book and the prophet Isaiah, and when he, and when he opened the book, 
he found the place where it was written. Did they go in order? I've heard this explained that in historical things, there was an order that they went in every single time they went into the Jewish uh, synagogue. Like if you're going to read a verse, you have to go in that kind of order. And uh, it, it, like, how do we know the historical part of how that works? Second Temple Judaism, because that wouldn't be true in Second Temple Judaism. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure. So, 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 is it, so when he found the place, he found mm-hmm. the place. Why is that in there where he found the place? Like, why did he find the place? What's, what, what does that mean? Have you ever the, seen what one of the scrolls of Isaiah looks like? Yeah. What does it look like? Uh, it, 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 it looks like uh, uh, out of order. I mean, it, it looks very, well, I just remembered his pages. I know. Uh, yeah. What I'm is not, the physical description of what the scroll of Isaiah looks like in, in that time in, in Judea? It looks like it was rolled up. Right. How long yeah. is it? Long. Yeah, it's, probably like se- it's like 75 feet long. Okay. Okay. So, 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 so when it so, says so, so, when he found the place, it's just that simple. He found the place and read. Again, people try to pour meaning into these things when there is no meaning to be poured into it. You read it literally. So, so how does it relate to... Um, when he, so, so connect that into Isaiah 60, 61 for me. How do the two sure. interrelate? The, what do you mean, how do they interrelate? What is, the, what is your presupposition? Is, is, is Jesus quoting Isaiah 61, yes or no? Yes. Okay. So, so, when I, if you go so let me read Isaiah 61. The spirit of Lord Yahweh is upon me because Yahweh has anointed me to bring good he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim release and freedom, to proclaim the favorable year of Yahweh and the day of vengeance of our God, to confront all who grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a head of ashes, the oil of rejoicing instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. So they will be called oaks of righteousness, planting the planting of Yahweh, that he may show forth his beautiful glory. So can you give me the explanation of why Jesus just quoted this part and didn't go shorter or longer? Can you give me that? Sure. Yeah, of course. So, so the reason Jesus specifically quotes this in 18 is that he is announcing that he is the Messiah. This is a messianic passage that they would have understood as a messianic passage. And so when Jesus went to the synagogues, Um, specifically in Mark and in Luke, you will see him declaring himself as Messiah. That is the purpose of this verse. This is not not some idea of Jesus's mission on the earth. That is a, yeah. But can you explain to me how Jesus gave the historical context and all this and that when he did that? I I want to understand that part. I want to understand how Jesus, Jesus, okay, so, so Jesus is reading this, right? So when we're reading 18 and 19, Jesus is reading that. Can yep. you show me how what G, how Jesus explained, gave the literal, gave all that? Can you break that down for me? I'm, that's where I'm lost. So again, he read it literally as the fact that he is the Messiah fulfilling prophecy. He doesn't need to give the historical context because everyone around him knows the historical context. They're not 2,000 years removed in a different culture. They're 500 years removed in the same culture. And so when we have to struggle to understand the cultural behind things, we have to understand things about Second Temple Judaism to get more of the flavor for the text. It doesn't change the fundamental meaning of the text. It simply allows us to see it as the readers from that writer would have seen it. But, but you just run so confused. What, what made him start okay. in that one spot and stop in that other spot? Like when I asked Because you, that's the beginning of Isaiah 61. Chris, very... do, you, do you mind if I piggyback off of you? No. Uh, maybe it'll help out. I know I'm, I'm right with you, though. Uh, but maybe to give some, uh, you know, some clarification. I think I, sure. I, I'm with Chris and in, in, in what he's saying, Brother um, Stephen. What I would what I would recommend is, you know, I, I would take the totality of what Isaiah is saying. Like, for example, if you go to Isaiah chapter 35 and start reading from four, let me go ahead and read it for you. It says, say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. 
right? So notice, number one, your God will come with vengeance, but also he will come with the recompense of God. In other words, to give healing and comfort to those who, uh, who are troubled, right? So number one, there's a plurality of persons here. Of course, I got to point that out, right? As tr as a Trinitarian, but number two, you'll notice what uh, verse I'll, five. I'll, Abby, Abby, let me pause. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a Trinitarian, and uh, no, I know you are. I'm just okay. naturally, <laughs> okay. I I see like every you know, um, not every verse, but obviously the context. I look for oh, these oh, verses I'm, I'm where gra I'm grabbing a pen on this. Which which what did you just quote Isaiah? Uh, what? So in Isaiah 35 verse four, you're going to notice two distinct uh, persons of the Godhead. You'll notice, behold, your God, that would be the Son Jesus. Who comes with vengeance according to Paul? That's Second Corinthians, Second uh, Thessalonians, chapter one, verse seven, or I would say verse six to ten, which is also quoted in Isaiah chapter sixty-five, verse sixteen. So Isaiah sixty-five, sixteen, Isaiah thirty-five, four, is a direct uh, reflection of Second Thessalonians chapter one, verse six through ten. Now, notice what verse 5 says. Then the eyes of Oh, sorry. Uh, unmute, Albie. Sorry, I thought Stephen was talking. You were having feedback. My bad. Oh, yeah, uh, Go ahead, Albie. No worries, brother. <clears throat> um, then verse 5 says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall, the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For water shall burst forth into the wilderness and streams in the desert. Normally, wilderness and desert, that's a reference to um, dead places where, you know, demons would hide out and so forth. So to talk about water and all of that uh, breaking forth is speaking of when the Messiah comes, he's going to come forth and also water these areas in where uh, you know, the deaf, dumb, and mute spirits, uh, you know, reside. So when you take a look at this in light of Isaiah 42, verse 1, where Isaiah 42, 1 is a direct quotation from, from Matthew 3, 16, where, you know, Christ priest, high priestly baptism, which is also quoted in Matthew chapter 12, 17 to 21, Isaiah 42, 1 through 4, in Matthew chapter 12, 17 to 21, my spirit will rest upon him. Now, really quick, I won't be long-winded. Now, when you go to Isaiah 48, verse 16, right? So the spirit, number one, rests on the servant. Isaiah 48, 16, then goes on to say, and then, you know, I'll bring it to Isaiah 61. Isaiah 48, and you'll see why I brought up Isaiah 35 to begin with. So in Isaiah 48 and 16 says, come near to me, hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was, I was there and the Lord God and his spirit have sent me. And now the Lord God and his spirit have sent me. Now watch this. Now, when you go to Isaiah chapter 61, And we're going to read one and two. You ask, why did he stop, um, you know, at, at part of two? I'll, I'll tell you why. So Isaiah 61, one and two. Now notice again, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because Jehovah has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound and to proclaim the acceptable year of Jehovah. Then he stops there. But that's not what verse 2, verse 2 doesn't stop there. Verse 2 goes on to say, and the day of vengeance of our God. So now the question is, why does he stop there? Because it's not the day of vengeance yet. That is the day where he comes to, um, you know, save us who are troubled from the hands of those who are oppressing us throughout the world, right? At his uh, second coming, that will be the day of vengeance. For now, it's the, it's, it's the time of the gospel. 
That's why he closes it there and he doesn't continue to read and the day of vengeance, as you also saw in Isaiah 35. Right now, remember, so, so the Lord, Al, real quick, yeah, before we go to the next thing. So that's why he stopped. Now, mm-hmm. why in Luke 423 were the people filled with rage? Yeah, well, they were filled with rage um, simply because, well, number one, a prophet is not accepted in his own hometown, but also, uh, well, I mean, yeah, I don't know. They just okay. They, so it's in the passage. So it's in the so the text gives us the answer. So the answer, yeah. why the people were so filled with rage, is that he said he's basically not going to do any of the miracles that he did in Capernaum when they were waiting for him to do some of these miracles. And he said to them, you will say to me, physician, heal thyself. Um, and, and he also said, you know, that Elijah uh, only went to the widow and that Elisha, there were lepers all over the place, but Elisha only cured Naaman. And so he's basically saying to them in this passage, I am not your trained monkey. I am not going to do the miracles you asked me to do to prove who I am because you should know who I am. I grew up here. And because of your hard hearts, then you will get nothing. And that's when they were filled with rage and tried to murder him. And so what the other thing, too, is that when uh, in Isaiah 61, who is going to be doing all of these great works? It's Yahweh, right? Yeah. Right. So he's literally also making himself equal to be God. This is one of the um, the deity claims of Jesus. So when he says, this scripture has been fulfilled in front of you, then the people were like, okay, well, maybe. And then he says, by the way, because of your hard hearts, I'm not going to do any miracles here. And that's when they were filled with rage. So that's a that's a that's an exegesis of Luke 4. So Stephen, does that kind of answer some of your questions about how we understand how to read scripture yeah what were the verses that uh, uh, chris what were the verses that albie went over your understanding of those verses which verses did he quote i mean i don't know if you were listening to albie or not which which verses yeah, did he I quote always listen to albie he quoted about 15 different verses so <laughs> I, no, I was no, driving. He only, no no he I didn't he only, qu- he only quoted he only quoted he only quoted six that i caught he quoted uh, Isaiah. Because I, I, I want, I want to, I, I want to be respectful. A bit, but like you know, I, I, I was driving, so I didn't jot down the actual. Isaiah thirty, uh, Isaiah thirty-five. The 30, uh, 35, four, Second Thessalonians one yeah. six to ten, and then what was it? Isaiah sixty-five verse six, Isaiah forty-two verse one, Matthew twelve sixteen well, through four. Well, one. Well, well, here, here, here's what I Isaiah thirty-five, right, four uh-huh. through eight. Um, okay, it would be. Excellent. If we were to cross-reference that, as far as the vengeance and the recompense of our God, it would be good to uh, cross-reference Isaiah sixty-five sixteen, Isaiah thirty-five four, uh, and then with Second Thessalonians chapter one six through ten, yeah, to but... see that that's none other than Jehovah, but Paul yeah. identifies him as uh, Yahweh's coming. And then we see the eyes of the blind shall be open and the ears of the deaf shall, uh, shall be unstopped. And we see these kind of things happening in Christ rebuking. Uh, like, for example, in Matthew 11, I believe in verse 5, you know, where he, again, the same place he quotes it with Luke 7, with uh, John the Baptist, when uh, he tells the angels that John the Baptist sent over, human angels, he sent over, he told them that, uh, yeah, tell him that the lame walk, the blind see, and the deaf hear, right? And I say human angels because angel simply means messenger, just to, just to train our minds to not just think, you know, a winded spirit being, a winged spirit being. Uh, and then you go with Isaiah forty-eight sixteen, where it says, come near to me, hear this. I've not spoken in secret. Right from the beginning, from the time that it was there, uh, <clears throat> from the time that it was, I was there, and now the Lord God and His Spirit have sent me. Well, it's not a coincidence that the Holy Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and then when he came out of the wilderness, 
He was filled with the Holy Spirit, and that's when he opens up Isaiah 61, when he answers the synagogue. The Lord God and his Spirit have sent me. And then we have the fulfillment of Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2, or part of verse 2, as he reads that. And then the part where also, where in Isaiah 48, 16, he says, I have not spoken in secret. Uh, that's another really interesting verse as well. When you take a look at uh, what John 18, verse 20 says, it says, Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet. And in secret, I have said nothing. So here's, here's my question, Albie. When, when, when Jesus is reading that and you left off the last part, in in in, in Judaism, in, Judaism it, in the Jewish temples, did they have a thing where you, they were supposed to continue to read, and there's a specific spot to start and a specific sp starting spot, a specific ending spot, or was it just like they could just be led by the Spirit and stop wherever they wanted with no explanation? How did that work? Yeah, well, that's depending on you know who's going to be teaching and who the rabbi is. Like for example, the known language around that time. Uh, was Aramaic, and that's what they would be speaking, and that's how the target means were recorded. So you would have the rabbi or the teacher, right? Uh, <clears throat> he would be reading in Hebrew, and you would have a translator in Aramaic paraphrase what the Hebrew is saying. Now, the difference between the teachings of Christ and the teachings of these uh, teachers is that they would always say, Rabbi so and so said said this or rabbi so-and-so said this but when it came with jesus if you notice like at the end of uh the sermon on the mount and his teachings there here's how they understood him in matthew chapter 7 28 and 29 and so it was when jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes the scribes always uh, said, oh, Rabbi so-and-so said this. Like, or today it would be like, Rabbi Akiva said this, or Rabbi, uh, you know, whatever, right, would say but, this. But, but now think, with Jesus. But I think that the answer to your question, Stephen, is that's an anachronistic idea of current rabbinical Judaism, okay? So current rabbinical Judaism has a calendar where they read certain passages. And the, the offense that people took when Jesus read from Isaiah 61 was not the fact that he was going out of order or he was doing something out of place. It was the fact that A, he was claiming to be his Messiah, B, he was claiming to be God, and C, again, why were they enraged? What were the two examples? Let's go back to the text. We always have to go back to the text. What were the two examples that Jesus gave of people not healing or, or not... Uh, um, showing mercy to the people around them. So he talked about Elijah and Elisha, the two most holy characters besides Moses in Jewish history, right? What, who were the people that he used as the examples? Because Elijah did a whole bunch of stuff and Elisha did as well. Who, what was unique? Look back at the text in verse 20. Let's see. Sorry. It's uh, um, Luke so 4, 23 and on. Well, it's Luke 4, 26. And then Luke 4.27, what did the two people that he mentioned, besides Elisha and Elijah, have in common? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm digesting, because I'm still thinking okay. about 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 10. Did you already go to those two? I just wanted to see what yeah, I'll but, be. But like, yeah, but I mean, that, that's getting way off the beaten path. Like, like, that's, like let's stick with this text, because we're exegeting this text. This is how we do Bible study. This is how we do exegesis. In 27, I did so, Albie, doing that. Huh? So, so you would have corrected Albie and say, Albie, shut up with that 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 Second Thessalonians one. No, I no, right. I, I wouldn't be that rude to Albie because he's my one of my best friends. But what I would say is, I don't. I think what he was trying to show is why it was pertinent. Because your original question was, why did Jesus start there? Why did Jesus stop there? And he was trying to answer that question. So that, but that's a, but that's a separate question as the one I'm asking now. What I'm trying to get at is in twenty six and twenty seven. What do the two people that God did something for have in common? Hold on, let me read it. 
Uh, so so, so okay. 26, uh, but, but, to, yeah, I can read it. To, but, but to none of them uh, was Elijah was sent, except uh, to Zephyrath uh, in the region of Sidon and to a woman who was a widow and uh, many lepers uh, were in Israel in the time of Elijah, the, the prophet, and none of them was uh, cleansed except uh, Naaman. So, 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 so the only one that was cleansed was Naaman. And I don't get what the Naaman thing. So what does the Naaman have to do with it? I don't know that. Okay, so so Naaman was a Gentile. Naaman was of Syria, yep. right? So Naaman was not a Jew. Yep. Zareph was in the town of Sidon. You ever heard of Sidon mm. and Tyre? No. Right. Okay, so Sidon and Tyre are, are, are part of Phoenicia, right? They're, they're, they're adjacent to Israel, but they're not in Israel. So again, the, the widow that God sent Elijah to was a Gentile. And so the reason that they wanted to kill him is he said that he would rather heal Gentiles and he would rather free Gentiles from affliction than the people from his own hometown. He was being extremely, extremely offensive to these people because they would not believe they had hard hearts. And so when you're exegeting these passages of scripture, it's important to read that entire context and the entire context as to why they wanted to murder Jesus is he said that Gentiles are even better than them. That's why they wanted to murder him. It's right there in the text. Do you see how much richness comes from just reading the text in a historical, grammatical, literal method? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, and I'm looking at all these verses. I'm going to make sure. I, yeah. I, yeah. Because I, 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 I get it, and I, and I look at it, and I go, hmm. So, 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 so Jesus is. So, so, if you if you were to describe Jesus' mission to come, what would you have said it is? What what is what was God, Jesus's goal? Because I've heard it sometimes Jesus. talked about. Because mm-hmm. here, here, here's why I'm asking the question. Here, here's what sure. begs the question. Um, Sometimes there is the, 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 the people that will say, and that you hear it on this app sometimes, where it's like Jesus is, is um, it, it was sent um, uh, to bring kingdom. So there's kingdom, kingdom, kingdom theology. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, the, and they use text for that because there's a lot of, because you can do a lot of word study and see the word kingdom all over the place. When I read this, this seemed more of what Jesus was called to do more than just kingdom. But um, using text an overall, from an overall perspective, what would you say Jesus was called to do if you were going to explain it in simple terms under 30, like a 30 second? 30 se- I could do it in 20 seconds. So Jesus specifically said that he came to die. Okay. That, yeah. that was his mission. Like his mission was not to, you know, he established the kingdom through dying because his, his mission was to live a perfect life and then transfer that perfect life to us and take on our sin at the cross. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, we've got, uh, you know, Luke, uh, what, nineteen ten. uh, for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. That's his mission statement. This is not his mission oh, statement. And because there's people this that, 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 that get in the scripture and then they they just say, "Hey, look at the text. If you just look at all the text, you see kingdom. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks." And Jesus says, "Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks." It just you don't you don't come to kingdom theology because you don't read the Bible enough to see the word kingdom all over the place. So yeah, you know, so, so some so you can take can't take texts in some other ways too because then you know do you go by abundance or specific specificity on you know or abundance of the heart you know I don't well again know. But, yeah, but, you don't go by you go by you go by what is the author's intent the author's intent here in luke is to show the people's utter disbelief in his own hometown and this is a recurring theme um where jesus is talking about a prophet is not honored in his hometown um, and this is specifically, and if, if you wanted to take it out to another level and you wanted to do a, an allegorize it for some reason, you could say that, you know, the people of Israel rejected Jesus, not even just the people at his hometown. I wouldn't go that far with the text, but I think that that's an inference that you can draw from the text. Again, what we, what we can see is that there is one specific way in, to read and interpret scripture. All other ways are wrong. And they must not be used. The literal historical grammatical way is the only way to accurately determine what is being said in Scripture because every verse only has a single interpretation. The Bible or any other text 
any written text, any human communication can only have a single interpretation. Now, there can be many applications of that, but there is one intent behind the author's meaning. And this idea that we can have multiple intents behind the author's meaning um, is a postmodern idea that is more Foucault than it is uh, you know, biblical. Well, explain so, the difference between, uh, explain the difference between like, um, okay, so parse out what you said about there's only one way to interpret it, but mm -hmm. that one way to interpret it could also have multiple meanings. It doesn't mean you're interpreting different ways. It means you're interpreting it the one and only way the author meant, which just so happens to have like a dual, like a dual prophecy or something like that. For sure, example. sure, sure. Like if the author is meaning for there to be a dual meaning to something, then yes, we have to suss what out what that is. But what we have to do is we're always looking for the author's intent, and the only valid meaning is the author's intent. And so, if the author intends to do a dual meaning, then we have to we have to figure out what that is, and we use those historical, grammatical, literal tools to do so. But again, there is only one interpretation or correct interpretation of every verse in the Bible. It is our job to come up with what that is, and then there are many applications to that. So, so here's my question: When when Isaiah sure. 60, 61 was being written, was it being written for Jesus, or was it being written for the people of, of, of the Jewish time? Was was Jesus the a part of the audience, or was was the people was the audience going to be the people listening to Luke four that were in that audience, or just to the was there two audiences or one for the, for when 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 Luke sixty one was being when when um, when Isaiah sixty one mm -hmm. was being written, who was the intended audience? The Jewish people at yep. that time. For the people that were going to listen to Jesus or both? So that's a great question. And so this has to do, so that book that I commended to you earlier, the Hermeneutics. But, but, but can there only writers, be one audience or can there be, here's my question. Yes, there can, can there be there two can audiences? There can only be one audience. So when in this verse with Luke 61, there is one audience in which Isaiah is writing to his audience, okay? And we have to interpret that scripture based on who he is writing to, what the culture is, what the history is, yada, 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 um, and what the context is, etc. Now, the biblical writers, in many cases, will take things, and this is what I was attempting to explain before, is they will take things that are seemingly out of context or do not fit with the correct interpretation of the Old Testament passage. The classic of this is Matthew 2 with Hosea 11.1, 1. okay? Now, what is the point of that? It is for emphasis, or emphasis, depending on how you want to say it. Um, it is for emphasis of a specific truth instead of we're going to give you an exegesis of the Old Testament passage and how it applies to the New Testament. That is not how they did things. They had a sociocultural reason to quote scriptures and they would do them. And for our modern ears, it sounds like it's out of context. But what it is, is it's it's looking at the socio-cultural impact of what that statement would be. Because yeah, I, I, I take, um, and I don't know if you're, you're on board with this, but I look at things through this lens. And you say, Steve, don't look at it through that lens. Just look at it through the author's lens. Because I think of things like, all, I believe all scripture is given by inspiration of God. is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction, righteousness. And the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for all works. I take that to literally mean that there's actually two writers. There's actually the Holy Spirit and, and the person writing. So there's actually two. I don't look at there being one. Does that make sense? Or is that an improper interpretation of that? So, so what we see in the scripture and what Peter says is that the authors were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is why authors have different writing styles and they have different meanings of, you know, when they're, when they're using idioms and things like that. Now, the idea that the Holy Spirit is carrying them along is why 40 different authors over three continents, over 1500 years of writing, there's a single narrative that doesn't contradict itself. That's one of the great proofs of the truth of scripture is that even though all of these people were from disparate times and dis disparate places and disparate cultures and disparate languages, even all of everything in the Bible harmonizes because the ultimate writer of the scripture is the Holy Spirit. So in the sense that there is a single writer that is correct. It is the Holy Spirit. But these 40 writers that the Holy Spirit used were carried along by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, because I do believe like God, 
God is all knowing. And I don't know if you take the all knowing to mean like God knew so much that he knew that we'd be even having this discussion when that was being written. So the audience wasn't just them. The audience was even us to, to this day, because I think God knew we'd be talking about this. I don't know if you take God being all knowing as being that all knowing. That when I, I do. One was well, yeah, that. obviously God is omniscient, but, but, but the, but the idea that we somehow in 20th century America could pick up a text, look at the prima facie reading of it, apply our socio, um, you know, cultural ideas to it and have it mean the same thing, I think would be foolish. I think that the job that we have is to understand the Bible and its correct interpretation according to the author that wrote it. And so the way that we do that is we first observe the things in the verses. Notice how I exegeted Luke 4, or Luke 4 for you. So from 18 to 30, we went through verse by verse, and I, I mean, I can go verse by verse, but like we picked out the major themes, we picked out the observations, we figured out who the people were that we were talking about, like with Zephaniah and with uh, Laman, or Naaman rather, um, we picked out that they were Gentiles. Like we looked at what was the passage that he quoted, which you were exactly right with Isaiah 61. What was the point that Isaiah was making? How does that relate to what Jesus was saying to the people? What happened in Capernaum in the previous chapters? I, I mean, I happen to know that. I didn't have to go back to, to Luke chapter 3 to figure out what happened in C Capernaum. But we we would do that. Like, that would be an exercise we would have. We're like, well, what happened in Capernaum? Like, he did a bunch of miracles in Capernaum. Um, and so... Because I've been called lazy for, for not being able to... Because I, I, I look at this and go, okay, this is really, it was really important to me. But uh, people that are sometimes into, like, uh, that are into a uh, kingdom, they say, well, you got to look at all the verses that have kingdom in it. I'm like, that's a lot of verses to go through and get this. Like, if you... Yeah. Uh, I asked about that, that type of study, and they go, well, I can kind of see what Jesus was called to do through this. I don't know if I need to look through every kingdom verse on there, but I do believe, you know, I, I do believe Jesus was called to do, just fulfill uh, Romans 10, 9, 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved with a heart one believes in righteousness with mouth confession and made of salvation. I mean, that's where I believe the end goal is for everything Jesus does. I mean, that's, that's where I, I see the center. hundred percent. So, so, yeah, quick note uh, for people that say you can't just read a prima facie reading. Um, man, I know Chris didn't mean this, but for the things that you need, turns out you can. <laughs> well, so sure. what you just read and what Chris said, uh, what Chris said, aim, yeah, and what Chris said, aim into, you can absolutely do absolutely do that. And not to your point, Chris, because I know you would you would say what I'm saying now. But for the people that are like, wow, you have to do all this crazy stuff. It's so crazy. How can you possibly know what God means? Turns out for the stuff that God says you must get right. Prima facie reading on its face. What you see is what you get. For the things that are super deep that, by the way, have little to nothing to do with salvation, then yeah, you're going to need to, you know, learn the true intent if you want to get to like exegesis and like prophetic stuff and, you know, things that you should only get to after you're already saved. Um, then yeah, you can go as deep as you want. But the things that you must get right, turns out it's really simple. Just read it. Yeah, because there's a simple ones that are like down. Um, but here's what I did. I, I, I'm not I'm not reformed, but um, that John MacArthur has a book uh, that uh, is pretty. So I've compared, you know, what I believe versus you know the reform stuff. So I looked at John MacArthur. I don't know if he's the right type of reformed, but I, I looked at the, you know, he has a book on the 52 scriptures to memorize. I'd say well, about half of those are, are things that I, I've seen as core. And I don't I don't you know like when like Romans 12, 1, 2. So, you know, have a renewed mind. You know, I beseech you therefore, brother, my mercy of God, present your bodies, living sacrifice, holy, acceptable God, which is your reasonable service, and not be conformed, this world be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I looked at it. If you have a life where you're going, if you, if you have, if your life is in self-sacrifice, I'm like, oh goodness, and you didn't do the, and you didn't in, in, interpret that scripture this perfect, specific way, you're going to hell on it. I'm like, I don't know about that. Because I do believe that there there is some the, there is some leading the Holy Spirit involved in it, and we probably argue that. Uh, but uh, Albie, I'd never heard that many verses given for that. So how did you? Let me ask you this, Albie. How did you? How did you learn to do scripture versus scripture interpretation like that? I've never heard that done much. Did, um, I mean, you know, you just, you you can make the connections 
uh, just but I've reading never, the scripture. I've, never, I've, I've heard a number of teaching on that scripture, and I've never heard it broken down that way by like, it seemed like you almost had to memorize. I've never heard it done that way, and it was pretty impressive, but good, in a good way, because he, here's what I believe to be true, Albie, is um, the reason that I, I was, I, I, I honored the way that you were breaking it down is I do believe Jesus, when Jesus says in John 8, 31, 32, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you should know the truth, and the truth should make you free. I always think the best interpreter of scripture is scripture, and not everybody agrees with that. No, that's, I think we'd that's all agree 100%. Uh, with that. And, and look, notice how Chris brought up Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, which is cross-referenced with Matthew 2, 13 to 15. Now, Matthew obviously quoted Hosea uh, 11 verse 1 identifying Jesus as that Israel since his name one of the names of Christ is Israel you can even find that in Isaiah 49 verse 3 and it says out of Egypt I called my son now what's interesting even about that for example is that's not the only passage where we find that out of Egypt I call um, we call I called my son the reason why I say that is because there's a prophecy in Numbers chapter 24, if you take a look at 3 to 9, right? And verse 9, verse 8, verse 9 is a direct quote from Genesis 49, 8 to 12 in regards to the Messiah um, coming from Judah, right? Now, verse 8 in Numbers 24, and I'm just going to paraphrase it. It says, God brings them out of Egypt, Right. So King Messiah, and this is not just a Christian interpretation, but actually a uh, <clears throat> Jewish interpretation of Numbers 24, that the King Messiah must come out of Egypt. How? Where? They don't know. But guess what? Christians have the answer for that. Yeah, wow. I mean, and that's so that's yeah, I mean, like. So what we're I guess what we're trying to say is, yeah, I, I understand what you're talking about with the kingdom and all that stuff. What they're doing is, again, they're taking things out of context. If you're doing word searches to attempt to build a, a systematic theology of kingdom and just using all the verses and lumping them together outside of their context, you're going to come up with what those people have, which is a very skewed idea of what the kingdom of God actually is. Well, you know, the, the, the problem I ran into is, is you know, some of it was like, okay, I can kind of see where you're going with it. But some of it was uh, uh, like when, when it gets into breaking the Trinity apart and doing weird stuff like that, it's like, okay, this just this just doesn't seem right. But I, 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 I've, I've been through like discipleship stuff where we basically just go scripture versus scripture. More of, yes, who wrote it. You know what, what? What was the author's intent? A little bit of it. You can look up the pastor that I went through. Is when he does like a, a chapter a day, and uh, um, uh, and then you, you know, and then he goes through a chapter a day of it, and just one chapter every day. And that's that's pretty much how I've been how I, I've been discipled is through a, a, a discipleship where first it was uh, level one level of discipleship was understanding the love of God. Level two was understanding uh, that the covenants old versus new and understanding how the two interact. And the third was, um, uh, you know, deeper study into, into the word. But when they, when we did deeper study in the word, we probably spent uh, 17 weeks on, um, on, um, you know, one a portion of a chapter, which was just so or so is the word from um, Mark four uh, uh, Mark four, like, uh, and, and, and what Nate said that was, that I, that I kind of wrestle with is sometimes you can go deep or broad, but it's hard to go deep and broad. Cause I talked, I, I remember going to a John MacArthur thing. So you have people that really understood how to break down the Bible, like a hundred times over better than me. We're sitting around a table and I'm like, Hey, what, what are your guys you know, 10 or 12 favorite verses? And they like, were so into the the thing that they didn't even know basic verses and it was the weirdest weirdest thing it, it, it's very rare that i run across somebody like albie who's quoting a lot of scripture and can go deep both it's very rare so um that, that's very impressive so that is that why you're good friends with albie he seems like a walking bible yeah i, I like to keep him in my back pocket it, it goes both ways Albie's like a Albie's like an AK-47. You got slung on your back. You can just, you know, yank him out at any time and just yeah. machine gun people. Yes, and 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 I and I've and I've and I've and I've, I have seen it happen on stages. I haven't been the beneficiary of you, Albie. I've only seen 
drama stuff and uh, that's it. But when I've heard you quote scripture, it's like, well, um, I do believe this, that um, uh, when, when you, um, have you ever heard this one? I don't know if there's anything, if there's anything scriptural on this, but uh, on every level, there's a new devil. <laughs> so it's like when somebody knows that much scripture, it's like, oh my goodness. Uh, yeah. So, so I, I really, yeah, I pray for you to be successful on this app. I'll be the only thing that I can, oh, God bless you. What? I appreciate it. I didn't mean to cut you off, but yeah, the only passage I could think of uh, with that one would be James 3, 1, and also Luke chapter 12, 47 and 48, right? He who knows his master's will and does not do it will receive many lashes. And also let not many of you be teachers for teachers. I'm not saying that I'm a teacher. I'm by no means a teacher, <laughs> but um, <clears throat> nevertheless, though, I, you know, we all share a lot. I just hope that the knowledge that we all have is a knowledge that leads to holiness and not to being puffed up. Otherwise it's all vain. Albie, which pastor have you listened to more than any other pastor? Like which pastor's teachings have you listened to the most? Um, Okay. So it wouldn't be uh, pastors, Uh, you know, so if you ask me who's my favorite pastor, I'm going to say Pastor Daniel Batarsa. That's my home uh, pastor. (laughs) So he's my favorite pastor, uh, only because I, I love him dearly, and he's, uh, you know, a true man of God. Now, who groomed me to, uh, you know, to basically father me in the scriptures to get me to a place where I'm no longer on milk would be a guy named Sam Shamoon. Thank you. Chris, Chris, who'd you listen to the most? Uh, MacArthur, Sproul, Steve Lawson. Um, Bodhi Bauckham. Uh Those are a lot of my favorite preachers. Bodhi Bauckham is my favorite preacher. Yeah, and I, I have to say, um, and then with that, as far as I guess, you know, listening, it would be R.C. Sproul had a vital, vital uh, role in my life, and also John MacArthur as well. Uh, these two were huge. Now, <clears throat> yeah, that's, you know... Mm-hmm. And and, uh, and oh and and and, me, and, uh, and 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 outside of, obviously outside of the triune God, the greatest influencers, the greatest motivators, and the greatest blessings in my life have been heretics. So they have always caused me to deep d- digger uh, deep <laughs> dig deeper in the Bible. Naturally, Just otherwise, like, uh, the early church, we'd, right? Yeah, exactly. We'd all have a surf. If we're not tested, we'd all have a surface level of understanding of what Scripture teaches. So. Because they're always looking to undermine the faith of the church. We always have to be, in my, in my eyes and in my view, always on the offensive. Because we are. We're on the side of truth. We're always on the offensive. Mm-hmm. And uh, St- uh, Stephen, let me commend a book to you as well. Um, Hermeneutics of the Biblical Writers is really great. Al, you need to get that one too. You'll like, you love it. Um, and uh, the, the other book that I suggest for really delving deep into interpretation uh, is uh, Living by the Book by Howard G. Hendricks. And so, oh, we lost him. Hey, uh, but, Chris. Yeah. I'm sorry, Chris. Can I, uh, there's a question I had. I guess anyone can answer it. Um, it's about the, uh, the canon of scripture. Now, I, I believe the canon of scripture is complete. But how would you respond if someone asked, is it, is it possible that God is it like a book out there that we haven't discovered yet that's inspired? What would be some of your scriptural reasons for saying that the, if you believe the canon is complete, I, I believe you do. But if you can just what are some scriptural reasons to say that the we know for a fact, absolutely, that there's, we're not going to find any other inspired books out there that would add to the current scriptures we have? Um, does that make well, sense? I mean, second, second Timothy three sixteen that all scripture is God breathed and is useful for reproving, training in righteousness and rebuke. So, I mean, the idea that there would be a lost quote unquote scripture that God has not preserved through the ages that would suddenly pop up is, I mean, it'd be kind of ludicrous, right? It would mean that God is not protecting his scripture. And so that would, that would mean that the scripture itself is meaningless, and so the idea that we would come up with a third Corinthians and discover it in a clay pot somewhere and be like, hey, we got third Corinthians, sweet, um, that God is not passed down through the ages um, for the reproof and betterment and teaching of the church. 
would just be a it would be a uh, an unbelievable and completely it would falsify the scripture. To be honest with you. So how many gospel how many gospels do you see out there, Chris? False gospels, oh, like after dozens. like as, or, t- t- yeah. tons, tons of them, right? Yeah. So the the canon was not. So, so the other so the other part of the error with this is that the Catholics want to tell you that the canon was declared by the church. And so, back, you know, past the Council of Hippo and a couple more councils, we had the full canon and we're good to go. Um, unfortunately for them, that is not the truth. The canon was discovered, not declared. And so when we talk about the discovery of the canon, it becomes very simple to know which books are in and which books are out because we know what the specific... Um, like the, the specific things that had to be true of each one of the books in the canon, you know? And so the, the, the error is always, you know, the, they always err to not including something in the canon if there's any question. And so like there were people that were pushing to put the shepherd of Hermas in the canon, um, you know, and if you just give the shit, you can go read the shepherd of Hermas right now. It's not very long. Doesn't read like scripture. And so you're like, like, why would we bother with this? And it's not because of a bad translation or whatever. It's just it doesn't have the same quality as inspired scripture. And, and that, I mean, it would be a and, self, it would be like a self fulfilling prophecy. So, like, if um, you know, if there was like you know a third Corinthians discovered or something like that, um, then all the Christians would be like, oh, well, sure, it's just an extra biblical writing because you know it's not meant to be canon. Because if it was meant to be canon, then it would be a canon, and we would have had it before now. So, or, you know, like the Gnostic Gospels, something like that, that you're like, oh, look, why is this canon? And it's like, well, compare that to all other scripture, and it's completely heretical. So, like, the way we know that one thing is not like the other is by comparing it. So it's like, well, you know, the book of Judas has the entire Bible against him. So that's why, because it's so far wrong, or if it was agreeing, if it was like 3 Corinthians, and it was basically saying the exact same stuff that First and Second Corinthians said, and it didn't disagree at all, it just said the same stuff in redundancy, you would be like, well, no, that was never supposed to be canon because, you know, we have what we need. Third Corinthians is a good extra-biblical writing of Paul, um, but it's not, it's not supposed to be canon because Second Corinthians and First Corinthians say the exact same thing. So, like, there's, there's no way to get around that, and I know detractors would hate that, but, I mean, that's exactly what we'd be left with. So either it was never meant to be canon because it's, it's so heretical as disputed by the rest of the Bible, or it's uh, exactly in line with other similar things in the Bible, which is why it was never supposed to be canon, because it's just redundancy. Yeah, and, and I, would say, I would say the church fathers as well, um, you know, were entrusted to preserve the words throughout the generations and the way the manuscript transmission um, was set into place. No one person had a monopoly on all the manuscripts. They were always, when Paul wrote a letter, it just describes would write it and rewrite it and send it out and write it and rewrite it so that, you know, the word will go out like no other. Now, the seal on the Gospels, this is really cool. The seal of the Gospels, the way you can discern whether or not a Gospel is official or a Gospel is a false Gospel, is this seal that our Lord Jesus gave us, the anointing at Bethany, right? Now notice what Jesus says in Matthew 26, 10 to 13. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Well, guess what? Of all the gospels that are out there, only the four gospels have this recording of what this woman has done. Every other gospel that's out there does not have this recording. Therefore... They are a false gospel, according to what our Lord Jesus uh, said. Good point. I, I, I never heard that before. That's a good point. Uh, one, two questions. I mean, two things I wanted to say. So would it be correct to say that the, the, the canon of Scripture was completed when the last book of the Bible that was inspired was finished? That's when the canon was completed. It's just that the, we had, the responsibility of the church was to recognize the canon of Scripture. Does that yep. make sense? 100%. Okay. The yeah, church in with the last, does not have any authority. You know, with the last apostle's death, I mean, there's, because an apostle was one who also saw 
Jesus. Like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 1, have I not also seen Christ? Am I not also an apostle? Right? In that, in that sense, right? And that foundation was built on the apostles. And even Paul himself was one of them who saw him and a man that wasn't sent out by men, but by Christ himself was sent out, ordained as the apostle. And on top of it, this is what's called the Torah of Christ that was prophesied in Isaiah 42, verse 4, and established in his body at the, at the covenant at, at Calvary, right? That Torah is what we, the new covenant, Testament covenant, right? In which we obey and follow, strive to follow and bow our knee to. That's what we honor and love. It's not that we're not under a law. We are men with law, and that law is the Torah of Christ. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, it says that he, by the Holy Spirit, sent out commandments through the apostles. And, you know, I can make a case for why that's important to know as well, um, that the apostles have the authority of Jesus Christ on earth, right, to not only discipline, but also to speak on his behalf and Christ uses their lips to speak to those uh, who, you know, who are in disobedience. And we see this happening, uh, Paul using this, right? That's not me speaking, but Christ speaking through me, uh, as he says, like in 2 Corinthians 10, uh, 3 and 9 and other places, or uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 13, I mean, and other places. All right, thank you, Albie. Um, just a, a follow-up question to what Chris was mentioning. I think uh, he cited, uh, what was it? Uh, was it 2 Timothy 3.16? Is mm-hmm. that the passage? Yeah. Well, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So when Paul wrote those words, though, the canon was not completed. Because, like, for example, the gospel, I mean, uh, John, the revelation wasn't written. So at that time, mm-hmm. the, the canon wasn't completed. But I do agree that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it is sufficient and so forth. But that when that when Paul wrote that, that wouldn't imply that there were not going to be other books written that were inspired, because again, John, the Revelation wasn't written at the time. Does that that make sense? Well, in first, second, and third John, Jude, um, first and second Peter, like none of that was written um, when Paul penned that. So there you go. It's not to say that first. You know, Second Timothy three sixteen means that there are no more scripture to come. It simply means that all of the scripture that is the anustas, right, that is God breathed, is going to have something in common. That it's God breathed, right? And that every single scripture that we have is ready to equip us for every good work. Therefore, we don't need to go outside of scripture to determine what a good work is or what it isn't because scripture is supposed to be sufficient to tell us uh, what is a good work and what isn't a good work, you know, and as far as uh, following the, the law of Christ. I agree. Good points. And I, I, this leads to another, I mean, this is, I appreciate the, uh, your input on this guys. It's uh, I like this discussion. Um, the issue of, well, the issue of prophecy. Did you believe in the concept of, I mean, do you like the spiritual gifts? Um, I struggle with what the gift of prophecy was in the New, New Testament. Um, some people believe it's, one of the things I read, I don't know, it was like Wayne Grudem. I forgot what theologian it was. Um, but that prophecy was a prophet, which I understand the prophets in the New Testament were different than the prophets in the Old Testament. The Old Testament prophets, no, when they, they weren't. Yeah, they were different. Exactly this. No, they weren't. They were exactly the same. Wayne Grudem argued okay. that they're different, but Wayne okay. Grudem's way off his rocker on that one. Okay, because yeah, I think what he said. Well, I'm going to paraphrase. Was that in the Old Testament when a prophet spoke, they spoke word for word what God wanted them to speak. But the New Testament people who had the gift of prophecy in the New Testament church were that they would get like a message from God and they would express it in their own words. I think uh, that's, I'm not that's kind of complete, a power. That's a power. Yeah, that's a paraphrase. Garbage. I don't. Okay. So, did, I mean, am I am I am I is that a correct like paraphrase of what he believed? 
Yes. So I will tell okay. you exactly where he gets that. So he goes to the prophet Agabus and he attempts to show that the prophet Agabus was incorrect about certain details of Paul's arrest. And so he goes to great lengths to butcher the Greek in order to attempt to save the idea of modern day prophets. So he uh, is pretty much the only one who has this particular interpretation and he's pretty much laughed out of academia about it. Like people are like, Oh yeah, you're Agabus bit. That's pretty good um, <laughs> because he's trying to, he's trying to defend the idea of modern day spiritual gifts and apostolic gifts. And so Wayne Grudem is a continuationist and he's torturing the scripture and he's, he's blaspheming really um, to attempt to, give a theological understanding for the fact that he he's trying to say that Old Testament prophets and New Testament prophets were different. Um, the scripture never teaches that. His his argumentation is flimsy and has has been so widely discredited, he doesn't talk about it anymore. Okay. And I happen to actually personally know Wayne Grudem. Oh, so, wow. I, okay. Th thank you, Chris, for uh, that uh, clarification. So, you know, I'm curious, like in First Corinthians 14, where, where Paul is giving instructions how church meetings were to be conducted, he says, you know, let the prophets, I think, speak two or three, one after another, I believe. So what what did those prophets, a genuine prophet in the church, what mm -hmm. what was their function? What did they do? I, I, they... I think you mean prophesy. Don't forget, prophesy mm -hmm. simply means to proclaim. As a matter of fact, if I read you a verse from the Bible what I'm doing is I'm prophesying to you. I'm sim I'm, I'm not saying that that's the, that, that's, there were actual prophets hearing from God during the time of the book of Acts. Um, I do not believe that's the case today by any means. Um, and I'm not, and I'm actually, you know, I do believe the gifts. Um, you, didn't, you didn't sell your $18 seed in that previous room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but as far as it, know, it was 50, they were even wrong about that. One was 18, one was man. 50. They should be put to death under Leviticus. Right? Man, so, that's a bummer. So, that, so that's what he means as far as uh, prophesying there. As a matter of fact, Paul himself says, you know, I'm glad that I speak in more tongues than all of you. Well, then how many different tongues are there? Well, obviously many tongues. I mean, you know, um, but yeah, but that's another. Yeah, topic. I mean, and, and again, there are the, the the function of New Testament prophets were that you didn't have a completed canon, right? Just like we were talking about, Paul died in sixty two A.D. The last of the canon was written sometime after seventy A.D., and so like you are having an entire church for forty plus years that is walking around without a complete canon. Well, how does how does God? fix that particular problem, he fixes it through giving direct revelation to New Testament prophets. And so this is part of the apostolic sign gifts, but it was also given to people who were not apostles because in local churches where there wasn't a complete canon, there needed to be the direct word of God. And so when the, when the canon was completed and you start to see in, hey, you start to see in uh, later days, um, especially the, the latter writings, there's no mention of any of the apostolic sign gifts, anything passed around 55 or 60 AD. And you start to see some of these things starting to pass away. Um, because a lot of the epistles had been written, um, they were passed around to the various churches. And as more of the word of God was disseminated, there were less and less need for direct revelation from God because he had written it down for us. And here, let me give you let, let me give you an example um, of of what Chris just said. In Isaiah sixty two verse two, you have this: you have the Gentiles shall see your righteousness, and all kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of Jehovah will name. Now, when do we see this happening? In Antioch. Right when they first called the disciples Christians, but who called them Christians? There were prophets there. They're the ones who were come from Jerusalem. Right here, let me let me go to acting uh, Acts eleven twenty six, really quick. Acts eleven twenty six. Yeah. So it says, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught 
great many people and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And in these days, in these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Right. And then Peter goes on to say what in First uh, Peter 4, 16, he says to glory in this name that we have been given. Right. Yet if anyone suffers, oh, yeah, I like the ESV's version of this and the NASB. Uh, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Well, thank you, Albie and Chris. Um, just I um, so when when the prophets or those who get the prophecy spoke in the early church, it it would be so they would only speak things. Let's say they got revelation from God, they were to speak that forth in the they're in the assembly. They would only be speaking things that would be eventually found in other inspired books of the Bible in the New Testament. Does that make sense? They would only be revealing truths that, let's say, you know, in the Church of Corinth, they would speak forth a truth that God gave them, but well, and that mm -hmm. truth would eventually. Or, would that would it? A a Agabus, remember, Agabus was one of those uh, prophets, right? And you'll notice that Agabus was one of the ones who always ministered to Paul and uh, even Barnabas. As a matter of fact, uh, you'll see. I think Agabus also appears in Acts. Uh, chapter 11 but you'll notice what paul does and um he what what he does in acts let me go to acts 21 uh, i think it's 10 to 12 really quick but you'll see in, in many places uh, or in several places paul actually goes and he receives counsel from agabus as a prophet let me, acts 21 10 to 12 yeah, so here, well, it says, while we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, thus says the Holy Spirit, this is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. This is Paul's warning. Right. And notice how Agabus speaks. Thus says the Holy Spirit. OK, well, thank, thanks, Albie. Um, so. But to directly okay, I think answer I've your question. Yeah. Like, yeah <laughs> like, I mean, the question would be, you know, what were the words they speaking, the, the actual literal word for word revelation from God in terms of what we now have? No. Um, they would be truths that God has specifically for those people at that time that would contain the same truths as scripture, but it wouldn't contain the writing style of Paul, for instance, or the writing style of Jude. They would simply be the direct words from God. So if a, let's say I was in the church of Corinth and I, you know, and I didn't have to get the prophecy and I'm hearing a prophet speak prophesying he was and let's say he's a legitimate the legitimate gift of prophecy and i wrote down what he said right that would would that be authoritative like is, no. is that that's not inspired scripture but it is the, no. the truth is inspired is that no? no sure the truth would be the truth but like you know that that it is being given but there is a reason that god did not preserve the writings mm -hmm. of anybody that was talking from you know the prophetic stance in the new testament it is because the authority needed to establish scripture was apostles. And because the, the miracle power was given specifically to apostles um, and their close associates to establish their authority to write scripture, you wouldn't have somebody recording the words of, say, Agabus outside of the book of Acts and saying, this is inspired scripture. That was therefore a specific purpose that Luke put in there to show about the arrest of Paul. And so what we're not going to say is every word that was spoken by a New Testament prophet would have been inspired scripture. It would have been inspired truths by God, but not every word that was written, or I'm sorry, that was spoken by a prophet of God in the Old Testament was recorded in their books either. And it also says that 
not every word that Jesus spoke was recorded, um, that there could be volumes of things that Jesus said and did right at the end of John. So, I mean, this idea that everything has to be written down as inspired scripture when they are speaking infallibly is incorrect. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. I'll be your very, both of you are very well spoken. I appreciate sharing your knowledge on this. This is uh, nice. Thank you very much. And for the record, Chris, would you agree that um, the, the closest one could come to being a modern day prophet, capital P, speaking the words of God, um, if there were a way to become such a thing, the closest way to do that would basically just be to read the Bible. But then it wouldn't need to be set down or written down because what would need to be written down is already written down, and the, quote, prophet is just reading the Bible. And sure. Yeah. I mean, a perfect example of this is there are, cer there are certain places in China where people are responsible for memorizing one book or a portion of a book. And so what, it, because they have their scriptures taken from them all the time, um, then it is that person's responsibility to, quote, word for word, say, the book of Jude or the first five chapters of Matthew. And so that would still be the inspired scripture. It's just that it's not written down because they have the scriptures stolen from them. They memorize the actual. May, may the Lord, may the Lord always bring that to memory so that we never take this Bible for granted, but always view it as a treasure, truly. All right. Anything else going on? Looks like chat's kind of calm. You know, I, Nate, uh, you, you said something now that it I, I thought it was something really cool and some <clears throat> worthy just to quickly make a note of, you know, uh, exactly what you said. For thus says the Lord, we'd be reading out of scripture. Now, a lot of people ask, you know, well, how do I hear God's voice, right? Or how do I do? Well, to hear God's voice is simply to read his written word. Now, it's easy to say that, but can we prove that? Jesus says in Matthew chapter 22, verse 31 and 32, to the Sadducees who only held to the Torah, who did not held, hold to a resurrection of the dead or to the afterlife or to the, you know, or to angels or spirits, spirit beings, um, what he says to, to uh, the Sadducees is this. And as for the resurrection of the dead in Matthew 22, 31, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? Then he goes on to quote Exodus 3, 6. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. It's interesting because the Sadducees weren't there with Moses in, in Exodus 3, 6. It was only the angel and Moses. So why is Jesus saying... Have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham? Because Jesus is saying, when you read the Bible, you hear the audible voice of God. And this is why even Stephen says, you stiffed heart, heart, you know, um, uncircumcised in the, you know, ears and heart. You're always resisting the Holy Spirit because to resist the word of God is to resist the voice of God. Yeah. Oh, and Kevin, to answer your question, the apostles we're talking about are specifically the apostles of Christ, right? So Paul has special authority as an apostle that is only given to him and to the to the 11 plus Matthias. And so when we read the word apostle, it simply means messenger. And so Barnabas would be a messenger, but Barnabas is never referred to as an apostle. He would never, he never says Barnabas, my fellow apostle. He says Barnabas, my fellow worker, um, but he never says Barnabas, my fellow apostle. Um, the, the idea that Junia was somehow an apostle just comes from a bad reading of the Greek. Um, when you actually read it in a better modern translation, there's no way to deter, there's no way to mistake that Junia is called out as an apostle. Junia is not called out as an apostle. So the, the people that want, there's actually something out there called the Junia project where they want to you know, try to reinterpret scripture to allow women pastors. Um, and that's one of the passages they use in Romans 16. 
So uh, the apostles had very special places. They had miracle power that they could exercise at will that we see demonstrated over and over in the scripture again. And so what we would say is God heals more today than in any other time in history. However, God does not imbue people with specific miracle power that they may exercise at will like the apostles did. So when Peter would pass by in Acts chapter four, I'm sorry, Acts chapter three, um, in the colonnade, people would put their their sick and their lame on the side of the road so that even Peter's shadow could fall over them and they would be healed. And so, <laughs> you know, this idea that there's, you know, Benny Hinn running around out there that has some type of some type of miracle power is simply not supported by the script. And was it uh, what's up, Todd? Paul? Hey, what's going on? I was just going to ask Chris. Uh, Paul was also an apostle, so it would be the 12, not including Judas, because Matthias replaced Judas, uh, but then 13, because it's 12 plus 1 when you add Paul, right? Yeah. And that brings up another interesting question we've talked about in here before. So it talks about the foundation um, of the, the streets in New Jerusalem. And it has the names of all of the apostles on the 12 foundations and then the 12 tribes of Israel. Wait a minute. Does Paul have his name there? Is it Matthias? Who, who's the missing apostle in the in the streets of Jerusalem? I think oh, it's it got to be, be one of the ones from earlier today that room we were in. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, Apostle Nate. Um, it's Prophetess. Sorry, Prophetess Nate. Um, or your excellency, I heard that too. Um, can we? Can my pronouns be um, your excellency and <laughs> your majesty? This is, cannot be a thing now. Oh, let's troll Steph. The next time we see Steph, tell her that she has to refer to me as your excellency or your majesty. Oh my gosh, you know what? Tell, her, a dr- <laughs> tell her yes. that's the new rule in the rear. Okay, so that for you, but also for Steph, without giving her any insight into this, just refer to her as like Pastor Steph because she adamantly like, I will never ha- go to a women pastor or I can never be a pastor. Let's just start calling her Pastor Steph. Perfect. Apostle Steph. What's up, Apostle Luke? Well, yeah, before we wrap this up, uh, Rick, what's up, Rick? Did you have anything on your mind? And by the way, thanks everyone for an awesome discussion. Like, yeah, we usually don't go super deep, but since it was mostly a Christian audience, like Al- Albie, um, Stephen, Edwin, Chris, uh, that, that was a very uh, awesome discussion about exegesis, hermeneutics, just all of it. Um, but yeah, Rick, what's up, Rick? Hey, uh, this is a question for everybody. Um, um, and and I, hadn't, I really didn't ponder this. Someone mentioned it someone asked me this and i'm like well i really hadn't thought about it um do you know why uh why do you think the church is not mentioned or alluded to in the old testament possibly it is and and you know i'm not aware of it but uh, what's your guys take on that yeah that's a that's a good one um, macarthur talks about it as being the age of mystery right because he talks about how the church is not called out in the Old Testament, or the, at least the church age, like this age between the first coming of Messiah and the second coming of Messiah. Um, it's simply not mentioned in the pages of the Old Testament, according to most scholars. I mean, people can give some some ideas about it, but honestly, like the idea of the church is simply not mentioned. And I think that the reason for that is because we have a skewed conception of the church. Um, the church, as far as we Gentiles go, we are engrafted vines to the branches, right? To the we're, we're engrafted branches to the vine, right? So we are just part of Israel, the prom, the real promise of Israel, and we are part of that covenant. And so God's new covenant with Israel is that He would give us a heart of flesh and replace our heart of stone, right? Ezekiel twenty-eight, um, you know, and that uh, we are going to be part of that that vine of israel and so i think that we just have a skewed misconception of the church in one part of it and i think that also it is a great mystery i 
I need to pull up the Greek and Hebrews, I believe, three, where I believe it speaks about Moses being in the church, part of the church of the Old Testament. I got to pull up the Greek, though, because our English translations won't do justice to it. I haven't looked at this in years. Well, it's just Give me a gathering. It's going to be ecclesia, right? Yeah, but and that never, you're right. But nevertheless, like it speaks about right the church of the old and the church of the new. Hey, Chris, I, I got one more question, if there's time. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering about the apostles' uh, ability to do miracles at will. Uh, I mean, I would certainly say, you know, they could do them at God's will, but, you know, you read about the times when, you know, Paul was desperately praying for a, a friend of his that almost died, and he said God had mercy on him that, that he didn't die. Um, but, you know, when you look at that, what is your take on it uh, concerning the miracles that they could do, and what do you think the reason was for, you know, this one that kind of lingered. Well, again, you, you're dealing with the apostles, right? So they're hearing directly from God for the most part constantly, right? So Paul is sitting right in scripture. He's in jail. He's doing all these other things. Now, from what we can understand, Jesus was the only one who remote healed anybody, right? Now, I could be wrong about that. and Maybe Albi can help me with that. But I'm pretty sure that Jesus was the only one who didn't just didn't have to lay hands on somebody like with the Roman soldier. He's like, your daughter is healed. You know, and he marveled over the Roman soldier's faith, you know, faith. Um, as far as I know, they had to have physical access in order to perform miracles. And also the performing of miracles was not for, it was not for their own glory. Like you're saying it's, it was also specifically to establish their authority as apostles. And so it's not like they were running around healing everybody in sight. Um, they were doing it for specific reasons at specific times to establish their authority. Same as Jesus did, right? And, and literally, we just we just exegeted Luke 4, um, where Jesus, <laughs> Jesus says, I'm not going to heal anybody in this town because it's his hometown. And he's basically scoffing at their unbelief. Um, and you know, the apostles would have done similar things. Um, but I think that the, the evidence is that they were able to, um, to do miracles at will at the, again, because we're compatibilists, right? So I'm pretty sure you're a compatibilist, Rick, you know, our self determination is the same as God's sovereign decree. And so when I say that the, the apostles could do things at their own will, their will matches the will of God. Um, two things like, well, Felix brought out Paul's handkerchief. And uh, I mean, I guess you brought out Peter's shadow. So, I mean, even though remote was like two feet away, technically, not physical contact. Uh, what, Albie, were you going to say something? Oh, yeah, I, I was just going to, you know, th there were certain things they couldn't do. Like, uh, for example, Paul implored the Lord three times in Second Corinthians chapter 12, right? Seven to 12. But that thorn, that messenger of Satan was left in his side to keep him humble for a greater purpose. Um, and also in John, if you look at John 17, verse 22, the glory which you have given me, I give to them, right? <clears throat> that glory is the glory of ministry so that the Father and the Son will be made known by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is, <clears throat> it, it just goes right along with what John 14, 13 and 14 says, and whatever you ask in my name that I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Right? I, I just want to say real quick, uh, I think you, that's a great explanation, Chris, what you said. I really hadn't thought about that. That's, I think uh, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, but, I mean, all of you guys, but, but I just want to say, uh, so I think it's a good answer. Thanks. Compatible well, sure. for the win. <laughs> Um, we'll leave it there. <laughs> I do have to run, but yeah, thanks guys for the awesome discussion. And, um, I guess enjoy your weekend and, uh, your homework is figure out your theological pronouns, um, and let us know what you decide you are. Um, as myself, I, I think I just want to be all of the above at this point. Can you so, please um, put your cash up and your profile?
Oh, I have to. I'm. I, I, does that mean I'm not a real apostle until I, I yeah, do a I cash up? I don't have one of those. Yeah, I don't either. But you know, um, I'm Ben, though. <laughs> I don't have any of that stuff, which is probably so I'm like the we, theological so we, equivalent of a starving artist. <laughs> if we went to that conference, that apostle conference, and I and we wore matching T-shirts that just said "heretic," would that be good? <laughs> Like a bit like a black t-shirt with big yellow letters or something on it, it just says heretic. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I don't know, man. That's sketchy. Like, would you w do you think it's like to the level like if they're like taking cash apps and like getting huge convention centers and like, you know, like the chick had like 20, the follow 20,000 followers. Um, do you think that's where like if you if you push too hard, you could be like disappeared and be like, hey, where'd Chris go? I, I heard he's going to some conference like anyone seen Chris? I don't think they have that kind of power. They're just charlatans. Like I wouldn't. Be well, I mean, not like the Illuminati, there. but I mean, you know, I don't know. Do some weird Scientology stuff. I, I don't know. I don't think they have any actual real spiritual power. I think their power is in their uh, cash up. Wait, to, to be clear, we're, we're not talking about spiritual power. We're talking about like some shady real life stuff. Oh, I like you like mafia stuff. <laughs> Like I mean, it was a joke. Mafia. Like, you know, I don't, I don't, I, re, I don't really think they're going to like chloroform you and put you in a van. Um, but um, that was the joke. I mean, I don't know. Have you watched Jesus Camp? I mean, that's the same. <laughs> no. Oh, you haven't, you haven't seen that movie, bro. Have you seen what American, have you seen American Gospel? No. Oh my what, gosh. What dude, are these things? Let, let me enrich your life right now. I actually, Okay, your homework is you need to watch American Gospel, <laughs> yeah, and then come back and discuss find it? it with us. It's on YouTube. Is it like a f American? It's a two. It's a, two uh, it's a it's a two hour documentary. It's on Netflix. Oh, is it on Netflix? Yeah, it's on Netflix. There you go. I don't pay those demons. I'll watch it on YouTube. Well, I yeah, mean, also it's, uh, demons, yeah. it's free demons. Yeah, um, American Gospel. Check it out. Um, it's got it, it. They um they interview. It's a documentary. They interview tons and tons of different people about the. The prosperity gospel it's very very interesting oh I, I found the one hour version oh full movie there we go oh buy a rent now we'll watch the uh, one hour free version there you go if you if you find me the two hour version uh that's free let, let me know otherwise i'm going to do the one hour version do you want we me to it. share my netflix account with you no <laughs> that, that would not be um i think our lord and savior may frown upon that probably would um <laughs> probably you're probably making jesus cry right now by having netflix Jesus <laughs> Christ about my sin every day. Hold on, Nate. I'll back down. Even, Baptize. Uh, those aren't literal tears. Those are not literal tears. Baptized. Oh, you got it, Todd. Okay, guys. Um, thanks for being here, and uh, right. we will hey, see you Nate, later. Have an Nate, awesome Todd's weekend. Gonna, yeah. Todd's gonna back channel it. Oh, okay, cool. I'll keep an eye out. Thanks, well, guys. Take care. Okay, cool. Yeah. God bless you guys. Good.